Today on the show, we could have left this podcast, folks, but we stayed. We stayed for vengeance. Mm, yes. Because this podcast uh-huh. killed our families. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it did. Yes, it did. <laughs> Left a scar on our face, too. Uh huh. With uh-huh. its whip like waveforms. That's right. That's right. <laughs> Welcome to Gamjabar, your guide to the iconic world of Dune. We'll be exploring the themes, philosophies, and characters found in the sandy depths of this vast universe, from Frank Herbert's groundbreaking novels to the adaptations on film and TV. My name is Leo. And my name is Abu Muad'Dib Usul Atreides. Harkin. Uh, oh, right. And also Hark- Dash Harkonnen. Dash, Har- Dash Harkonnen. <laughs> we kept both names in the marriage. Today on the show, we are halfway through talking about yes. Dune Part 2 by Denis Villeneuve. Mm, and never heard of it. we are so excited to talk about the end of this movie. We are. We are. And hey, quick spoiler warning right off the top here. Yeah. As the title and description of this episode implies... We will be spoiling literally every single scene and beat of both Denis Villeneuve's films, part one and part two. So make sure you've watched both movies before you continue listening. And of course, we will also be discussing the events of the first novel. So we recommend you've read the first novel in its entirety to better understand today's breakdown. Now, of course, we have done a comprehensive analysis and breakdown of the first half of the movie. So please go listen to that before listening to today. Today's part two. Indeed. Also, shameless plug, now that everyone has seen part two, there are a lot of people who are going to maybe go read the book. We did a book club of the first book. So check that out. It's on our feed. It's a lot of fun. And uh, I have a couple of friends listening to it now. So yeah, check it out. Yeah, definitely. Lots of folks getting into the books. No better time than now to become a Dune fan. It's so exciting. It's so much fun. Now, speaking of Dune fans, my goodness, we need to shout out our Kwisatz Haderach level patrons, Case Aiken, Daniel, Dion, Roman, Caballo, Jonathan, Lambert, and C.R. Spruill. Oh. My goodness. Listen, we see many ways forward, but so many of them end in us not expressing properly how much we appreciate you. The one way forward that involves you understanding how much we appreciate you is yep, holy war this one. Oh, it's a holy war <laughs> <laughs> it's really high stakes <laughs> but uh hard alternative we're just gonna say thank you so much <laughs> we're just gonna say thank you thank you so much for that level of support it's truly what helps keep the show running of course our gratitude and our heartfelt thank yous extend to all of our patrons who support at every level. We could not make this show without you, and we appreciate you dearly. Indeed we do. All right, here's the game plan for today's episode. We are picking up right where we left off in the last episode and continuing our scene-by-scene deep lore analysis of Dune Part 2. That's right. Listen, same caveat as last time. We don't have this movie yet. We can't go frame by frame. We can't pick apart every pixel of every frame. We've only seen it three times. All right. Yeah. So this analysis, today's uh, discussion is going to be based purely off of memory and the meticulous notes we took. We cannot promise 100% accuracy in this analysis, but we're going to do our best with everything we're working with. And then, of course, we will revisit this fantastic work of cinematic art Once we have it in streaming or Blu-ray and and we have the chance to go frame by frame and pick apart those little like background details that you might have missed. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. With housekeeping out of the way, let's take a quick breather and prep ourselves because folks, right after the break, we are diving back into this movie. So stick around. We will see you in a minute. Diving? Like swimming? That's right. You can't even see the bottom. Whoa. 
Welcome back, everybody. My God, it's time to begin. And where we left off before was the introduction of Fade Rautha Harkonnen, uh, which is very exciting. It's his birthday, and we're on Giddy right. Prime. And my fucking God. Oh, my God. What an absolutely visually stunning part of this movie. Yes. The choice to film the Giddy Prime scenes in infrared very very cool now this creative choice came reportedly from the genius mind of greg frazier who's just out here fucking cooking with gas <laughs> and when denny told him he was like you know it's going to be a sandy coliseum i don't want it to look visually too much like arrakis right right Makes sense totally greg says quote i said i have a brilliant thing i want to test and show you so I tested the technique with Roger Yuan, who plays Lieutenant Landville. He has no hair, and he was the perfect candidate to test it on. And Denise saw it and said, bingo. End quote. Bingo, baby. God, that's got to feel so good to have like yeah. an out-of-the-box idea to be like, I don't know. And you show it to Denis Villeneuve, and he's like, bingo. Right. Amazing. What an incredible choice. I will say I have filmmaker friends and film buff friends all ecstatic <laughs> about this scene in the movie really like they've been messaging me and texting me like this creative choice the shooting it in infrared the way it not only is just a visually striking choice but also is so in line with the storytelling of giddy prime of right. the harkonnens the yeah. very black and white nature of it all you know all of that is such a brilliant storytelling and visual choice. And I, for one, can confirm that a lot of filmmaking friends and a lot of friends who just love movies and watch a lot of movies were blown away by this. Yeah. I mean, that's it, totally understandable. Apparently, though, it did make Jacqueline West's day <laughs> fucking awful. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, because here's the thing. So costume designer Jacqueline West, she actually had to change some of the materials of the costumes. And from the clip that I saw, she had to change it a couple of times. Like she had to really experiment with different materials to make sure it worked. Fascinating and so unnecessary and so appreciated. So, so, so yeah. cool. The attention to detail and just the added challenge of it, right? I remember in our interview with Patrice Vermet, the production designer of the film, he talked about how many movies will just play it safe, right? Let's do the thing we've done before because we know how to do it well. Yeah. And on this film, Denny Villeneuve and the rest of the production team, they approached it with this mentality of let's break some shit. Let's push some boundaries yeah. and try stuff we've never done before. Yes, it's scary. Yes, it might be a disaster. But what if it isn't? And this is one example of it being the opposite of a disaster and in fact turning out to be one of the best parts of this movie this choice to like take on the extra challenge of shooting it in, in infrared which frankly changes everything it changes the way you light a scene it changes the way the costumes work i.e jacqueline west having to switch up the materials because certain materials showed up differently under infrared conditions it changes the way the actors wear makeup right like yeah everything totally about the filmmaking process flipped on its head because of this creative choice, but they took on that challenge and they weren't afraid of trying something that frankly would be unconventional on a Hollywood set of this scale and of this complexity. Yeah, totally. Now, all of that technical jargon aside, we are celebrating today the holy birthday of Fade Rautha Harkonnen, the That's right. heir to House Harkonnen. And he's getting ready to enter the Colosseum. Now, we see him presented with two knives. He, of course, expresses his disappointment in the quality of one of the knife tips. It's too dull by straight up murdering like, <laughs> two of his attendants. <laughs> yeah. uh, this is a bold introduction to the Bene Gesserit alternative prospect. Like, recall, Mohaim is going, we have other alternatives to Paul Atreides. And yep. everyone's like, that fucking psychopath? This is him. The one who just straight up slices someone's throat to demonstrate a point. <laughs> it's wild. Totally. And he's looking good while yeah. doing it, by oh, the way. Um, right? Like, yeah. <laughs> we need to pause here for a second. 
Uh-huh. I can't wait to pause when I have it on Blu-ray. Oh my but gosh. It's my new wallpaper. Austin Butler yeah. fucking shredded. Insane. Looking stunning as Fade Rotha. And if you'll recall, there was a lot of chatter before the release of this film when Fade Rotha and Austin Butler were first revealed, right? When we got those first images of him in black and white. There was a lot of chatter. People going, oh my goodness, what? What's with the bald? He looks weird. He he doesn't look pretty boy enough, right? Like Fade Rotha in the books is kind of this like psychotic playboy, pretty kid. And folks were kind of miffed about, oh my gosh, like Austin Butler, wrong choice, bad casting. And I can't believe they made him bald. Like this is just the wrong direction to take with the character. I disagreed with it at the time. And now after having seen the movie, I strongly disagree with that sentiment. Fade Ratha, I think, looks absolutely incredible. And the direction they took with his look, I think, was perfect. And I even have some anecdotal data to back me up. Because this past weekend, Mm -hmm. I had some friends who have never read the book go see the movie. And of course, they immediately wanted to come chat with me about it. (laughs) And one of their hot takes was that Fade Ratha was actually too hot. And it was hard for them to believe he was that much of a villain. Which perhaps says something about their moral compass. I (laughs) I need to sit down and talk with my friends about that. But they thought he was hot. And there's plenty of thirst about Fade Ratha on Twitter as well. So that's just my anecdotal rebuttal to the idea that Austin Butler didn't properly embody Fade in the book. Yeah. Well, and I wanted to say... It is very important for the story for Fade to not be a caricature of just evil and, I don't know. Yes. Like a monster, right? Yeah. I wanted initially, I said on mic at some point, I don't I can't point anybody to an episode, but I said at some point that I wanted Fade Ralpha to be, I wanted some people in the audience to be cheering and rooting for Fade in the final fight against Paul. Uh-huh. And I think part of the way they do that is give him charisma and give him the sort of like, you know, charm. Is he actually a like sociopath? Yes. Is he a psychopath? Yes. But is he like evil? Capital E? No. And I think making him a hot shredded dude <laughs> who has yeah. like some genuinely charming little moments goes a long way in getting yes. that done, which is awesome. You know, completely agree. Now, it's worth mentioning that in the books, in this Colosseum chapter, Fade does have this, like, sneaky plans within plans thing going on with the poisoned blade and the color of his gloves, which he does a little bit of a switcheroo with to confuse people. But in this scene in the movie, considering he picks up the blade and licks the tip, (laughs) we have to imagine that poison really isn't at play here. And they just sort of simplified that that part of it, that faint within a faint from the book. Right. Now, he also says something in this scene about the bodies that he's killed, right? The two attendants he murdered in cold blood being used for his pets or their organs being served up for his pets to presumably eat. Yeah. And my first thought when I heard that was, oh, the spider monster thing from the first movie. Right. That's his pet. Sure. Yeah, that makes but sense. But then in this scene, the the camera immediately cuts to these three lovers of his that are lounging nearby, seemingly implying that they're the pet. And this is reinforced later in the movie when he calls Chani Paul's pet. So perhaps there's some off-screen cannibalism going on <laughs> here in the Harkonnens. Yeah, I, I a little bit take away the capital E evil thing uh, because, yeah, does seem <laughs> like he feeds people to his pet humans that he owns. Um, yeah. Hmm. Well, you know, could be a Quisaz Hatterack, you know. <laughs> <laughs> as long as he's got the powers, he's got the powers, you know. As long as he's got that body, he's got that we, we body. Don't, mm, mm, no. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of assessing him and his body, we have Margot Fenring out in the triangular arena. She's in her booth. Leia Sedu doing a fucking phenomenal job as yes, Margot Fenring. Yes, my goodness. Yep. And she's in her sort of Benny Gesserit observational booth, basically here on her mission sent by Mohaim 
to observe the Na Baron, and this is also when some like fellow Benny Gesserit sisters arrive. They're dark yeah. cowls all in white, which is very, very cool. That's right. I loved this visual. I, I saw this pointed out online somewhere. I can't remember where, but someone had commented that how cool is it that the infrared lighting from interior to exterior, right? In On the interior, we get the black robes of the Bene Gesserit. But as soon as they walk out into the sunlight of Giddy Prime, their robes invert. They turn completely white. And, you know, maybe reading a bit too much into the visuals here, but <laughs> uh -huh. I wouldn't put it past Danny Villeneuve. How cool of a visual is that for a secretive sisterhood that works in the shadows to steer the politics of the empire but is universally trusted by the public and the people in power to have that transition from black robe to white robe yeah it's sort of Pretty like cool. white as innocent and like you know i don't know honest like dark dark as mischievous cunning yeah yeah so neat now, let's take a moment to talk about Count Hasimir Fenring. <laughs> yes. Seeing as I'm perhaps the number one <laughs> Het Fenring fan in the world. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Many suspected that he would, as a character, be cut from the movie. Abu, you are among the many. That's right. And he was. Now, I think like many people, as a huge book fan, I hear that a character has been cut. I hear, okay, Count Hasmir Fenring's not in the movie. What does this do to the tapestry of this story? What does it do for me as an audience member to see what characters are now doing the things that he would have done? And broadly, I think we can all agree it works great. The movie still works great. It's yeah. fine. It also does, Denis Villeneuve in a number of interviews has said, this movie is really focusing, this is a Benny Gesserit movie. Like, this is a movie about the Bene Gesserit and about the Bene Gesserit and what they're doing. And rather than wasting scenes being like, this is Margot Fendering here with her husband. Yeah. Instead, we can just focus on Margot and we can just focus on right. what is she here to do. And so I think this is nice because it does emphasize in line with Denny's vision. It emphasizes the Bene Gesserit and the women themselves without worrying too much about like the men that they're using as cover for their shadowy activities. Completely. Now, there was some news that Tim Blake Nelson was rumored to be playing Fenring, and in an interview with Anthem Magazine, he gives us some insight into what may have ended up on the cutting floor. This is what he said about his experience on the film. Quote, I was in a scene, and the scene's no longer in the movie. I had a really cool cameo. It was a fun little part. But as it happens, movies are too long and they have to remove some stuff. I was unfortunately on the short end of that. End quote. Okay. So just taking, taking it on the chin. Taking it on the chin. Appreciated it. Also wanted to point out already we can tell he was not going to be some integral character who was like, in a bunch of scenes and doing a bunch of stuff. Like, right. if anything, it would have been a tip of the hat to this character, but ended up on the cutting room floor. That's fine. I mean, this all but confirms him as Fenring, considering he was a quote unquote little cameo yeah, in totally. just one scene. That obviously would have been that finale showdown scene with the emperor where he shows up in the book as well. And it seems like he wouldn't have even showed up in the giddy prime sequences at all if he just had one little cameo so it, even his role sounds like it was minimized to begin with and then they just ultimately decided like okay just cut this all together you know we need to tighten things up which totally makes sense yeah i think that's a i think you're probably right that maybe there would have been some scene toward the end a blow a blow certainly for fenring fans like you and the four other fenring fans out there but <laughs> oh, harsh per, okay per, perhaps a blow harsh that y'all can live with you know may, maybe maybe start like a little support group and uh the four five of you can can get some coffee together and talk yeah, about it i was gonna it. say we can order a single uber <laughs> <laughs> four seats is enough we don't have to do the the large <laughs> that's right okay well back to the events of the movie here we're in the coliseum 
Fade enters through the t- vagina door. I don't know how else to describe <laughs> that door. <laughs> he enters the Coliseum, and the announcer is out here riling up the crowd, baby, as three of the last Atreides captives are also shuffled into the arena to face off with our birthday boy. Right. Now, it's very clear immediately that two of the men are drugged and Fade goes for them first and very quickly dispatches with them. But Lanville is putting up more of a fight and it becomes clear to Fade and then very quickly everyone in the crowd watching that Lanville is not drugged and is fully aware of what's going on. Right. Which could be dangerous because this is really for show. No one here actually wanted to put the Na Baron in true danger. Right. But now it appears he is in danger. And as far as the drugging goes, we actually saw this happen. We saw the two prisoners being drugged earlier with this like orange fluid in a syringe. And as far as book lore goes, we know from the book that that orange fluid is a lack of drug. Yeah. Because yeah. the key effect of a lack of drug is that it removes the user's will for self-preservation. Thus, it is particularly useful in spectacles like this, in gladiator fights where you're just sending prisoners out to slaughter. Yeah, absolutely. And actually, Margot may be, I think, the first person to kind of notice it, which is a nice right. little tip of the hat to the Benny Gesserit, you know, observation of minutia. Indeed. But when the Baron's aide is like, oh my God, your heir is going to be fucking killed, maybe. <laughs> Baron's like, it's fine. Like, let it play out. And we will, of course, learn that this is part of Baron's plan. That's right. Now, this is another departure from the book where the lack of the drug was actually Fade's plan Mm. that he made in conjunction with Thufur Hawat, a character conspicuously missing from this movie. Right. Poor, poor Thufir. Absolutely cut from this film. Doesn't show up for a single frame. And... As we know from the book, Thufir is very much involved. He becomes a captive of House Harkonnen, and he's very much involved in this like complex, subtle scheming between Fade and the Baron and himself, right? He's trying to make sure he sets up the Harkonnens to fail and the Atreides to succeed. Right. Fade's yeah. trying to usurp his uncle. Baron's trying to keep his fucking nephew in line who's trying to kill him all the time. You know, it's a very complex plot in the book. And while we miss a lot of that scheming and complexity, right? That's what makes so much of the politics and characters in the book so fun. In a film, in a two-hour, 45-minute movie that you're asking people to sit down with, with a bucket of popcorn, there are only so many plot threads you can ask the audience to keep track of simultaneously. And to me, it makes a lot of sense to take this complexity, simplify it into a thing that's still very believable, and have one less thing for the audience to be having to focus on in an already packed film full of dense ideas. Now, as far as the Thufir cut itself, we do know that there were scenes shot with Thufir Hawat. And in an interview with Entertainment Weekly, Denny Villeneuve explains why he had to cut Thufir from the film. Quote, One of the most painful choices for me on this one was Thufir Hawat. Villeneuve admits, he's a character I absolutely love, but I decided right at the beginning that I was making a Benny Gesserit adaptation. That meant that Mentats are not as present as they should be, but it's the nature of the adaptation. End quote. Yeah, I think many of us will agree that it is better to make a strong choice that yields a great product than to try to do like what the sci-fi miniseries did, which was kind of do everything and then it all is kind of weak. Totally. And this is something I've been getting into like fucking Twitter squabbles, pointless Twitter squabbles about all week with people who are just like absolute purists, right? Like who people who clearly came into this movie ready to hate it because it was inevitably going to be different from the book. The reality is, is that a one for one conversion of the book would have been a fucking awful movie. <laughs> Yeah. And an absolute failure of cinematic storytelling. In an adaptation, you must make changes. You are working with a totally different set of tools. 
And you must pick the tools that tell the story in the most authentic way that tries to honor the source material, but still plays to the strengths of the medium in which you are telling the story. So this is me getting up on my soapbox. I've said this many times on the podcast, and uh, you know we've both explored this idea before, but adaptations require change. And the key for me, at least, is are the changes still in line with the original ideas, the original energy and vibe of the story and with the characters as they were presented in the source material. And if they are, then perhaps that change was necessary to tell a better story in a different medium. And this feels like one of those cases. Agreed. Now, back to the Colosseum, the fight against Landville, Fade Rautha versus the Mm. undrugged, captured remnant of House Atreides is intense and brutal. And we see why Fade Rautha is so fearsome. He's not just this like psychotic dude who licks knives and feeds humans to humans. He's yeah. super intelligent. He's focused. He's a very capable fighter. Right. There's also this moment where one of the crab people tries to help Fade. He like kind of inches forward. He's like, oh, I'm going to get that holiday promotion. <laughs> I'm going to get that bonus. <laughs> and he puts the hook in the back of Landville and Fade kind of pulls Landville to the side and roars back, you know, fantastic. He's literally like, don't interfere. Yeah. And finally, Fade does land the killing blow, right? He Mm -hmm, whips mm -hmm. the knife around in a show of sudden strength. Just as like you, we get a sense of how incredibly strong he is and he kills Landville. But the thing is he catches Landville in this like, almost sensual embrace right yeah and whispers you fought well atreides <laughs> <laughs> you are that was good actually wow thank you i'm a little sick right now it makes it much easier <laughs> you fought well line, atreides you know, yeah <laughs> huh. Huh. you fought well <laughs> and he, but and, but then he like stays forehead to forehead with landville as he dies right before you know like pushing the body to the sand and everything but there's like a real moment here i loved this I thought it was so, oh, it's a wonderful choice from Denny to show Fade's honor. Like as twisted and weird as Fade is, he does have honor and he is going to be the first to say at the end of a fight, as we see later, whether he wins or loses, you fought well, you know, or whatever he says, right? Yeah. It's yeah. great. It's so good. Loved it. it. It's so good. And again, It avoids this temptation to turn him into a a cackling, psychotic villain caricature. Yeah. And it adds that depth to him. This is somebody who admires a good fight and admires someone who can give him a challenge, regardless of whether he wins or loses. There's something admirable about that at the end of the day. Now, post-fight, Fate is mad. He confronts the Baron and he's like, uncle, bro. You were trying to kill me out there. Yeah. Why was that prisoner not drugged? And the Baron calmly takes the tension out of the room and promises his nephew that if he works with the Baron, there will be more victories for him to come, not just in some Coliseum. He's about to get Arrakis, and if he performs well on Arrakis, baby, we're shooting for the moon. I'll put you on the throne The Emperor's Throne is what the Baron promises to his nephew here. And you know what? That's tantalizing. Fade immediately goes from being mad to being interested in how exactly we're going to do that. (laughs) Yeah. And I think same. How how exactly are you going to do that? (laughs) Yeah. I'd like to know the plan. This is one instance where I did feel the, the missing presence of Thufir. Because in the book, Thufir plays this like critical role in the Baron's plan to vie for the throne. And a critical part of that is utilizing the Fremen, the same thing that Duke Leto Atreides planned to do, utilize the Fremen to overcome an attack from the Harkonnens. Here, Thufir is proposing to the Baron, utilize the Fremen, take out the fucking emperor, take the throne. Uh, In the movie, all of that is gone, of course. So I'm a bit confused what the Baron's exact plan of action here is, because he says something along the lines of, well, the Great Houses, once they find out that the Emperor was involved in wiping out the Atreides, they're going to turn against him. 
none of the great houses want the Sardaukar to be sent to eradicate them. That's a great fear. But the thing that I can't help wonder, and that I imagine the other great houses would also bring up, is the fucking Baron was involved in that plan to eradicate House Atreides. You worked with the Emperor to do this. Yeah. So, like, uh, uh, you know, it is hard for me to believe that everyone's just going to be on the Baron's side once he, he reveals the Emperor's betrayal against the Atreides here. A yeah. bit less of a believable plot, in my opinion. Yeah, there's definitely that element of, like, yeah, getting him off the throne is not the hard part. The hard part is convincing the Landsrad to care that he wants the throne. Like, right, to back him. We know that Leto Atreides was a popular guy. And very likely, late if Leto Atreides was alive, the Landsrad would be like, yeah, you'd be a fine emperor, sure. But Baron Harkonnen? No, he's not, he's not nearly par- popular enough. So, yeah, I agree. Um, I also love this like hookah pipe <laughs> that Baron the has. Hookah, yes. The audience chuckled at this uh, in one of the viewings I saw. Very, very fun. And that hookah pipe is also probably full of something from Ikaz as well. Whether right? it's like right. Samuta or um, mm. sustained ecstasy, baby. Yeah, That's sus- Samuta timeless drag, sustained yeah. ecstasy. Yeah, Ooh. could be. I mean, it seems intense to be on Samuda while <laughs> talking to your enraged psychopath uh, nephew, but, you know, t- t- each their own. Right. Some people are super high-functioning Samuda users, you know? <laughs> we can't judge. I have coworkers who every day I can tell. <laughs> well, anyway, later that night, the whole city is celebrating. We got fireworks nonstop, but fade alone in a long corridor. When mm. Margot Fenring Hello. appears behind him, Fade confronts her. He Uno reverse cards her. Suddenly he's behind her with a knife. And she's all mysterious and coy and sexy. And things start getting trippy here. Right. This sequence is genuinely one of my favorites. The way she's asking her questions and then the way that her face will go into blackness artificially, but then be fully illuminated with the next burst of light it's really, really cool. And of course, this is working to sort of like disarm and almost hypnotize Fade. So he's getting dizzy and disoriented and he's following her. Mm-hmm. And we're seeing, because again, he he does this thing where he kind of ends up in the guest wing. She's using the voice on him, which is so cool and such a good reminder. And in, in, a, in a movie full of characters going, do the thing (laughs) right to have someone like subtly using this i understand probably what you want and i'm going to talk to you in a way that gets you to do what i want to get what you want right yep yep very very cool and this leads us to the moment that i think we both got the most excited about which is (laughs) the second gamjabar test oh my goodness this is probably, again, there are changes I don't love. This is a change that I love more than I can express. It's so smart. And it happened in the book. We're never told it happened, but we know it had to have happened. So it's just incredible. It shows Denny understands this text forward and backward. It's spectacular. Uh, I couldn't agree more. What a brilliant choice to show us this in the movie. And obviously having Fade be a Kwisatz Haderach candidate himself is a departure from the book. Because in the book, as part of the breeding program, he is just the final stepping stone to the Kwisatz Haderach. But I love this change as well. Like, make him a candidate and make his role within the Benny Gesserit plan and within this Benny Gesserit focused movie, as we know Denny is focusing on, make his role bigger, make yeah. him more important, but also make him more Paul's equal and more of a foil to Paul in this, right? Yeah. Paul, our protagonist, is the Kwisatz Haderach candidate. But now this other guy, this like psychotic knife flicking cannibal, is equally a candidate within the Bene Gesserit plans. Such a cool juxtaposition there to show that the plan is all encompassing. The Bene Gesserit are looking for something very specific and it has nothing to do with how 
hashtag good or hashtag bad you are. Yes, 100%. I'll also point out, and I missed this the first time I watched the movie, Fade literally says, I've seen your face before. Where have I seen you? And she goes, I don't think so. And he goes, oh, that's it. I saw you in my dreams. This is Fade having dreams of things that have not yet happened. Yep. And so cool. Oh, it's so good. I think the second or third time I saw it, I was like, oh, my God, he's having dreams. <laughs> yeah. And I can imagine her going, do things sometimes happen exactly as you dream them. And he goes, no, right. not quite or whatever. Uh, so good. A scene very reminiscent of the Gam Jabbar scene from the first movie. Yeah. Done pitch perfectly, in my opinion. Now, much to my chagrin, we don't get a hot, steamy, triple X rated sex scene <laughs> between Margot and Fade. True. Yeah. And instead, we hard cut to Kaiten with Irlan Moheim and Margot simply debriefing about Margot's mission on Giddy Prime. We learn from their back and forth that Fade has passed the Gamjabar test. He is a human. And they now know the levers with which to control someone like him. Margot says he's sexually vulnerable and he's a psychopath, but he's also extremely intelligent and he's got a sense of humor, as twisted as it may be. And Margot also oh, confirms humor, for honor. us. Oh, whoops. Uh, <laughs> he has a sense of humor. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> he's got real good bits. He's He's got really funny bits. Man, you should see him at the Comedy Cellar. Just <laughs> he kills. The bloodletting, my goodness. Uh, kills <laughs> yeah, <I'm glad> <laughs> um, he's a psychopath uh, he's also extremely intelligent and of course he's got that sense of honor as twisted as it may be right margot also confirms for us that she has secured his bloodline in case something were to happen to fade she is pregnant with a baby girl as she has been ordered to do now, a quick aside, because I believe you and I both cl clearly got this question a lot this past week as folks saw the movie. Mm -hmm. Yes, Benny Jesuit do have the ability to choose the gender of their baby when they become pregnant. And yes, that means that Jessica chose to have a son in direct defiance of her orders to have a daughter for Duke Leto. Right. So that was a conscious choice, not something that just happened. And that may be confusing to folks who haven't read the book because it's never said explicitly that the Benny Jessard have that ability. It's true. Now, there is an interesting exchange in this scene where Margot turns to Moheim and says, well, why didn't you conduct this mission yourself, right? It's a mission of utmost importance for the Kwisatz Haderach program. And Moheim replies that, well, you know, she's more the mother type. She gives off that mom energy. <laughs> yeah. And that very likely would not have worked in seducing Fade, considering his history. And the specifics of his history are that he killed his mother, which I cross-referenced in both the book and in the Dune Encyclopedia, and I couldn't find any reference to. So Fade killing his mother, to my knowledge is something that was created for the film, perhaps. Yeah, Peter DeVry killed his mother. Right. Um, that's the closest I can think of. Right, we don't have much on his on his parents or his relationship with them. But again, Moheim's logic here is sound. And yeah, he certainly would not have gone for a mommy figure, considering he's got his mother's blood <laughs> on his hands. I do like the idea of Moheim being like, are you fucking crazy? <laughs> I'd have been fucking killed. <laughs> <laughs> he would have killed me. <laughs> I don't want to die. <laughs> Stupid. If you die, I don't care. If I die, that sucks. Right. right. <laughs> you know, Moheim, like most managers I've had in my life, don't actually want to get their hands dirty with the work, you know? <laughs> 100%. I also love that we're seeing the nature of Benny Gesserit intuition and also their, like, matchmaking techniques moheim points out that his levers are humiliation and desire which is interesting right it's maybe he's in this place of power no one contests him so for someone like margot to sit on a bed and be like neil he's like i like this <laughs> 
This is great. <laughs> so she, clearly Margot Fenring's a dom. Yeah, they're out here playing 4D chess is, is the long and short of it. There's a reason for everything the Benny Gesserit do. Yeah. Now, moving on, we get one final scene here on Giddy Prime. It's a short one. We basically see Fade officially being given the governorship of Arrakis in front of a large crowd of people as these massive ships and tanks and battalions of soldiers depart the planet headed for Arrakis. Very reminiscent of like World War II footage in black and white of like Hitler's troops marching, mm, right? Yeah. Blitzkrieg. Like the imagery there is very explicit and intentional in my opinion. We do in this ceremony though get a moment where the baron grabs fade and goes in for a kiss mm -hmm. and then fade even more aggressively sort of grabs him back and goes in for an even more aggressive second kiss yeah same baron's sexy it's a quick I get it. <laughs> hey if the baron's your type the baron's your type no shade it's still in scars guards in front of me we're we're smooching we are we're smooching. guaranteed smooching right watch out stellan <laughs> now it's probably not worth reading too much into this. It's just a choice here. But it could be seen potentially as a very, very subtle reference to the Baron's sexuality in the books, where he is presented as uh, either bisexual or just fully homosexual mm. in the book itself. Who knows? It's too quick of a scene to really read that much into it. Uh, and it seems like a bit of a throwaway moment. But... Just wanted to call that out. Yeah, I, I, my personal take is just, just ceremony, right? Like in the US, kissing on the mouth is a big deal. But other parts of the world, it's like, yeah, you greet people you basic barely know with a kiss on the cheek. And then the people you super know, you kiss them on the mouth. Fuck it. Why not? That's right. We only live for a few decades and then we all die. It's great. So Tell them, just get them in there. Get them in there. Get those <laughs> smooches. <laughs> so I'm like, okay, this is just a different culture. That's my take. Listen, if, uh, if people feel strongly the other way, let's talk about it. Why not? Completely. Come to our podcast at gmail.com. That's the place. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Title the email is boys kissing. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, that wraps up all of the scenes of Giddy Prime in this movie. Feels like a good place to take a quick breather, Leo. Yeah. Before we get primed for our return to Arrakis and the truly explosive rest of this film. So stick with us, dear listener. We'll be right back in a minute. Welcome back, everybody. Oh, I hope you're ready for the rest of the movie. So back on Arrakis, we join a crew of smugglers landing a harvester to mine some spice. And I very much enjoyed that they have basically a sail attached to their carry-all. I know. So pirate. Such so pirate energy. Pirate. I love it. <laughs> Great. Yeah, I love it. Now, Gurney Halleck, everyone's favorite troubadour warrior, is playing his balisette, singing a song, still suits full of piss. Yes. Yeah, Hands caked with sand. That's right. So much fun. To see Gurney Halleck singing, this was something that apparently was cut from part one, not this song in particular, but him playing the balisette and singing. Yeah. Happens all the time in the book. But actually, as a fun little fact here, Denis asked Josh Brolin to work with Hans Zimmer. Wow. To come up with the song he sings in the film. So cool. <laughs> so that song, <laughs> Still Suit Full of Piss or whatever it is was a Hans Zimmer, Josh Brolin collaboration. And I bet you could tell just by how yeah. good it was. Give him the Oscar. Give him the Original Oscar. Original song, motion picture. For most piss in the still suit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, cool stuff. And I appreciated that extra touch, right? That Denny asked Josh Brolin to be like, well, Hans Zimmer could whip something amazing up for you, right? And we could just have you pretend to sing it on camera for us. But no, I want there to be like a touch of Josh Brolin and a touch of Gurney Halleck in this. So get in character, go to Hans Zimmer, and whip something up. I love that. It just adds that extra layer of authenticity to the film. Yeah, totally. Now things go uh, south quickly for the smugglers here. <laughs> uh -huh. Because they basically walk right into a Fremen ambush. These 
really cool, like big square magnetic plate things, which we're told are mines, start just f- rushing toward the harvester and sticking to any metal surface they can find and exploding on impact. It's such a like dramatic and cinematic moment. Gurney, being the professional that he is, drops to one knee and pew, 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 snipes one of the mines <sighs> midair. So cool. My God. Yeah. So cool. Now, unfortunately for the smugglers, they are quickly overwhelmed. They're no match for the Fremen ambush. And Gurney himself finds his back on the ground and a knife, Paul Atreides knife specifically, in his face. Fortunately for everyone, Paul recognizes his old master, orders the rest of the Fremen to stop, and we get the reunion, the iconic reunion between master and pupil. And in fact... It's quite book accurate because Gurney Halleck delivers the young pup line from the book itself. And frankly, it's a really cheesy ass line, right? Like in the 1984 film, I was like rolling my eyes. Young pup! (laughs) Young pup! (laughs) Also because Patrick Stewart like shouted it in his like Shakespearean like, oh, young pup! Way too Shakespearean, way too, yeah. (laughs) Gurney Halleck nailed the delivery here. Josh Brolin nailed it. The sort of more grounded, genuinely excited, young pup, young pup, you know, like uh, the the way that your uncle would greet you after thinking you were dead and lost in the desert. Happens all the time. Happens all the time. I loved it. Great delivery here. And I liked that we kept that book accurate. Now, soon after that emotional reunion, the two begin to catch up and we learn that Gurney started working with the smugglers. They helped any surviving Atreides to get off planet, which is a nice touch. Mm -hmm. Glad some of them survived. But Gurney himself chose not to go off planet. He chose to remain behind for vengeance against the Harkonnens. And later, as Paul and Gurney are walking with this Fremen troop, Gurney wants to get caught up on the situation. And he asks Paul, like, okay, so like, I've heard of Muad'Dib, you're Muad'Dib, things seem to be going well, like, why aren't you leaning into this whole thing, right? Like, you yeah, yeah. overcame a smugglers with such a small group of fighters. Imagine what the whole of the Fremen fighters could do. You could take right. over all of Arrakis. Totally. You need to yeah. utilize this boy. Avenge your father. And this is where Paul has to explain, not only for Gurney, but also co- sort of spelling it out for the audience here, that his visions show him billions of corpses across the universe if he leans into the Messiah, if he leans into it and goes south and embodies being the Kwisatz Haderach and the Mahdi and the Lisan al-Gaib. And that message could not be clearer for the viewing audience at this point. And I'm glad Denis Villeneuve chose to just be extremely blunt about it in this way because you could get lost in the subtlety of it all and still fall into that trap of thinking Paul is a heroic character in this movie, but here he he explicitly spells it out for us. Right. He's like, if the things that you're about to see in this movie happen, billions of people will die. Exactly. Exactly. The audience is like, I think the credits oh, are rolling now. No. Uh-oh. <laughs> <laughs> yep. I'll also point out, earlier when he talks to Chani, the first time he has the vision of going south, he says, millions and millions, dead. Right. So the fact that it's now billions across the universe, you know, everything in this movie feels so deliberate. The words characters are using, the way that they explain things. This feels like Denny putting in a subtle clue that things are getting worse. His visions are getting worse. Things are spiraling and he doesn't know what to do. Right. Absolutely. I caught this on my second viewing as well, that it changes from millions to billions here. Which is just and I l- love that subtle progression. Yeah, yeah. I guess not so subtle progression. It is actually quite the exponential progression in the amount of corpses across the universe. Well, it would have been not subtle if Chani had turned and gone. I thought you said millions of millions, and he said right, it's right, billions right. now because things are getting worse. Completely directed completely. by Brian Herbert. <laughs> 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 Co-directed by M. Night Shyamalan. <laughs> wow. Turns yeah. out no, Paul no, absolutely, absolutely. is Alia. 
Yeah. And, and honestly, something I love, Denny Villeneuve has been quoted recently as saying that he hates dialogue and he thinks like TV shows in particular are just like way too dialogue heavy. And in the medium of cinema, like you're presenting a picture and you need to tell as much as you can with what's happening on screen. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And not just in like heavy handed exposition and dialogue between characters. I think this is an example. Nobody here says things are getting worse, but the implication is clear. Things are getting worse and people are much more fanatical about Muad'Dib. Right. And yeah. he is starting to lose control of this prophecy. It's all, it's all in the subtext here. Uh, and I really appreciated that subtlety, that restraint that this movie shows all throughout. Yeah, totally. Now, the troop sets up their tents and Gurney attempts to set up his <laughs> and he's not very good at it <laughs> and in an adorable little moment right chani is looking at this water fat ass <laughs> foreigner <laughs> and she's like it's a lot of water and paul's like Ch- chani don't drink my family it's don't don't suggest <laughs> harvesting my family and she's like but right, he's right. helpless and he's like okay then help him like what do you what do you want and she goes and helps him which is very nice. I saw this as like the in-laws, you know, it's like, go help, you know, this guy who's important to me. So he gets to know you too. Right. Right. Totally. Now later, Paul and Gurney are sitting atop a dune and he reveals to Paul Gurney's like, listen, you're headed toward war and I can tell you don't want to go South. So I have an alternative atomic bombs, (laughs) atomic (laughs) nuclear bombs, the Atreides family atomics, have been hidden and Gurney knows where that is. Yeah. I love this change. Yeah. It makes so much sense that I find myself immediately asking, why the heck wasn't this in the book? It explains where the atomics suddenly come out of and why Jessica and Paul wouldn't think to use the atomics at any point earlier in the book, considering they're with the Fremen for two plus years. Yeah. Making Gurney the one who kind of ha- holds the quote unquote key to the location of the hidden atomics because of course like being duke leto's right-hand military man he would know such a thing it's perfect it it makes so much sense and again to your point from earlier speaks to just how fucking well danny villeneuve knows these characters and knows this story absolutely i also i had at least one friend voice that this felt a little bit like a deus ex machina oh okay fair And I understand that because the family atomics aren't mentioned at all in the first movie. So it's like, suddenly we have these 92 atomic warheads. (laughs) (laughs) Right. And you're like, oh, oh, suddenly. Um, But I I think that's just, it is implicit in the challenge of communicating all these intricate, tiny moving parts. Plus, naturally, I think um, the the atomics have to be there because it is kind of important that it takes down the shield wall and blah, blah, blah. It's in the book. It's very important. It's an important part of the book. And Completely. we dodge quite a bit of the atomics talk in this adaptation. There isn't the whole, you used atomics against us and broke the great convention. And no, I didn't. I used it against the natural formation and, you know, the semantics, the kind of like weird legalese that exists in the book. We dodge all of that. This is just firepower. This is just another type of power that Gurney is the key to. And I love it. And it's great. Yeah, completely agreed. Now, after the debrief with Gurney, we cut to a scene inside Paul and Chani's tent. And the two are basically talking about what he's learned about the atomics. He's like, Gurney can lead me to the atomics. This changes everything. I could threaten to blow up all spice production on Arrakis with these bombs. Yeah. And he even says the line, it's sort of modified from the book, but he says, if I can control Spice, I can control everything. Yeah. Which, if you've been listening to this podcast, you know, is a line we quote in the outro of every single episode. Right. Of course, Chani, not super sold on this whole Atomics thing. Because, sure, that would give Paul ultimate control of the fate of Arrakis, But that does take away control of spice and control of desert from the Fremen, from her people. It's a major shift in power. So she's a little skeptical of this idea. But 
Paul ultimately is like, well, I need you to trust me. Like, aren't I one of you? Aren't I accepted as a Fremen? To which I loved that despite how much she loves him, Chani does not say, oh, yeah, of course, babe. Like, you're one of us. Of course, you're a Fremen. Welcome. She still believes that while she loves him and he's not an outsider to her, he is still an outsider to the desert and to this culture and to the history that these people represent. Absolutely. Because he frankly yeah. always will be, no matter how much he tries to integrate. And I think that's a message that, again, folks in discussions online uh, are seemingly missing. There's this talk of like, oh my God, like how could Jessica wear like a hijab looking outfit, like appropriating from in culture, appropriating Islamic culture. And it's like, yeah, man, you're supposed to be weirded out by that. <laughs> Yeah, you're supposed to be like, why is this white woman wearing this and bossing these brown people around and like co-opting their culture? It's supposed to be a huge red flag. And Shawnee herself is calling it out here. She's like, well, are you trying to say that you're Fremen? Because like, let's be real. You're not. You're, we've accepted right. you, but yeah. you aren't born and bred. And I like that this movie draws a clear distinction there. Uh, I love this little moment. It's very short. And ultimately at the end, she, her love does overcome and she's like, okay, okay, fine. I'll talk to Stilgar about this atomics thing. We'll check it out. So she does relent, but I like that she stood her ground on the fact that he is not truly 100% born and bred Fremen and never will be. Right. And, you know, for those who have read the books, that does continue to be kind of a poignant point. Yes. You know, no yeah. matter how well you know the Fremen, there is a very different experience if you were not born in a siege and raised among the Fremen. Absolutely. Now, the next scene, we have Paul, Stilgar, Chani, and Gurney looking at where the atomics are hidden, seemingly in such an obvious spot that nobody bothered to look. <laughs> Amazing. We get some uh, delightful, hilarious banter between the grumpy uncles, Stilgar and Gurney. Yeah, so cute. They have this sort of like competitive energy in the books, so this is very true to their relationship in the books. But in the books, they do ultimately come to love and respect each other. So it's fun to see it grow slowly but surely, right? Right. And then, of course, Paul asks, well, how many, you know, atomics are there? And Gurney's like, enough to blow up the planet. <laughs> yeah, brother. <laughs> yeah, brother. <laughs> and, of course, Stilgar and Johnny are both like, fucking Say that again? <laughs> right. What? Uh, say what? It's just a figure of speech. <laughs> really delightful. We actually got an email recently from someone that said there was so many emotionally impactful things happening throughout this movie. So many tense, intense, like wild things happening that Stilgar's levity and Gurney's levity, like the kind of laughing moments with these two characters made all of the difference in the world to like yeah, kind of cleanse the palate a bit and then get you back into the zone. So as much as, you know, it's, it's kind of a funny moment played for laughs. It is still very, very important. And I think used masterfully. Agreed. Now the quartet approaches the hiding spot. Paul uses genetic finger lock door thingy to open the big round metal door. And I just, thought it was poignant that in a movie about like what does it mean to be atreides what does it mean to be fremen what does it mean you know just seconds ago paul was like i'm not a foreigner what are you talking about right here's a lock that only opens to foreigners <laughs> so <laughs> yeah, well all right yeah i guess yeah. i am a foreigner uh but even in a, in a also in a movie that explores harkonnen versus atreides paul is atreides yeah so this all seems very poignant and they walk into this room with 92 atomic warheads, very casual, but even cooler than the 92 atomic warheads enough to blow up the planet is uh -huh. the portable glow globe. Oh thing. my God. I need one uh, uh, that Gurney tosses in. It like projects this sort of rectangular beam of light around the room. Very cool. Yeah. Super unnecessary. <laughs> <laughs> You could have just used one of the other glow globes, but they, uh, yeah. yeah, they did this whole thing. And so cool. I'll just say that this, it's like moments like this. 
that completely immerse me in the sets and the world. Yeah. Again, the the production just didn't have to go this hard. <laughs> it's it's a fairly straightforward scene. We're looking at bombs. But no, they were like, no, we we need this glowing orb to shoot a beam of light around the room in the most cinematic way possible. And boy, did I love it. Now, next we get a quick shot of Irulan journaling about the reports from Arrakis, after which we join Jessica as she arrives at a temple where the water of life is made. Now, a quick note about Irulan. She says that the reports are coming to her from Bene Gesserit missionaries on the planet in the South. And that's a poignant reminder for the viewer that this Bene Gesserit manipulation machine that's been working on Arrakis for generations is still churning, baby. The gears yeah. are still turning, and there are still informants and Bene Gesserit among the Fremen people, planted among them, to continue to seed things like the prophecy of the Lisan al-Gaib and to continue to direct their culture and history in, in directions that are most beneficial to larger Bene Gesserit plants. Yeah, totally. Now with Jessica in the temple itself, we get a demonstration of how a little maker, a little worm, is drowned in water to create this like pure distilled spice essence, which we know is called the water of life. Jessica, after witnessing this, tells the caretaker that, uh, well, you know, a man might stop by eventually, very shortly. <gasps> but that's not allowed. It's certainly not allowed. You're right, Leo. You're right. You're absolutely right. Yeah. But here's the thing. Uh-huh. I need you to allow him to try taking the water of life. Okay, done. Sure. Good. Yeah. Because, you know, I believe in the, you know, I've, you're the... Yeah. 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 Let him try. <laughs> oh, okay. Jesus, I will. <laughs> <laughs> Good. Good. I'm glad you got my message. <laughs> this is the first instance of Jessica not knowing she can just say please. Uh, okay, I pointed out on on our uh, on our spoiler cast thing, and on TikTok there's a clip, and on YouTube it's a clip. I talked about like the voice being used unnecessarily. This is, I think, the first example of you don't fucking need to use the voice. Just say you need to have faith in God or something. And I promise you, this woman would be like, all right, bet. Yep. Yeah, it, it's a little unnecessary use of the voice, which we see a couple of times throughout this movie. Now, Paul wakes up in his tent after another tough dream. Yeah. And this time, instead of a famine in the South, it is atomics going off on the horizon and Chani dying, her face burned and melting from the Oof. blast. A really, like, genuinely horrifying little scene. Yeah, definitely. And another moment that, if you've read the books, feels very intentional. It's playing with some imagery that ends up being very significant later in the story, right? Right. Absolutely. If you know, you know if you what know, this you know. is referencing. 100%. And, we, and for sake of spoilers, we can't say anymore. Right. But, you know, read Dune Messiah. Read Children of Dune. Read them all. That's right. They're all good books. And you know what? We got book clubs on those books. <laughs> we so do. Read them with us. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's great. Now, Paul yells for Chani uh, because he just had this dream. He can't find her. And he rushes out. She's atop the dune. It looks just like his dream. He panics. He runs up. But instead of an atomic blast, it is Siege to Burr in the distance being sieged. Ooh. Horrifying stuff. Now, at the same time, we cut back to that Arakeen command center where the Harkonnens are planning out their strategy. And Fade is there with the Baron. And the Baron is in a great mood because he loves Fade's idea here to use old-fashioned artillery to shell these mountains, causing those rocks to collapse in on the sieges mm. and presumably bury or murder anyone inside. We even get this really horrifying shot of the cistern that we saw earlier, the holy cistern being buried in rubble. Th that hit me. It's just a very quick, like, one-second shot. And 
uh, man, the emotions I felt feeling that, knowing how much that means for the Fremen, powerful stuff. Again, powerful visual storytelling without having to say a single line of expositional dialogue. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Y'all got me fucking fired up and hating Fade Ratha and being horrified by this, by this attack on Siege to Burr. Right. Great stuff. It also shows us Fade's strategic and tactical side, right? Yeah. Again, getting at this idea that he's not just this like loose cannon psychopath. He is here doing what Beast Raban was unable to do. He is fighting back against the Fremen. He is using this old-fashioned artillery, a technique that the Harkonnens do actually use in the book that's lifted directly from the book. And it just shows us that, Fade, again, once again, Fade is a skilled combatant and he is anything but this like hot-headed, immature child who could lose control at any moment. He's cold, calculating, and brutal. Now, somebody who is perhaps less cold, calculating, and brutal. <laughs> uh -huh. uh, perhaps brutal. He gets plenty of brutality. Definitely not cold and calculating. Raban storms into the room, pissed off, losing his fucking cool, yelling this and that. And Fade quickly makes it clear why he is the favorite sibling and the heir to the Harkonnen throne. He knocks Raban to the ground, throws his boot in front of his face, and forces his brother to kiss his boot. Yeah. A really embarrassing moment for Raban, really demeaning for him. And it shows us the hierarchy within the Harkonnen household. Raban's really at the bottom of the pecking order at the moment. It's also in this scene that I legitimately, when I, when, uh, you know, there's, there's this scene where Batista is on the ground, he's next to the boot, the knife is pressed into his neck and it's starting to bleed. And, uh, there's this line and it's like, you embarrassed me. And I'm like, mm. was that Stellan Skarsgård or was yeah. that Austin Butler? And of course it cuts to Fade's face as he continues to say, if you embarrass us again, you'll kill, you know, kill you. And it's like, oh my God, Austin Butler is doing a fucking awesome job of being in that sort of like a younger Baron Harkonnen voice. Yeah. Totally. And I've actually seen some interviews as they're doing their like press junkets where apparently Austin Butler didn't even talk to Stellan about doing that. He just watched a ton of Stellan's movies and then worked with a dialect coach. So he just like whipped that out <laughs> and Stellan's like, it's amazing. <laughs> it's so he it's he sounds <laughs> like me when I was younger. It's unreal. Yeah. So very cool. Uh and successfully not Elvis, you know? Right. I Hats think. off to the dialect coach that helped him break the Elvis curse, you know? <laughs> of course. And also, I want to say just hats off to Austin Butler. I give him a lot of shit for, you know, Elvis. And I think he has gotten a lot of ridicule in the public eye. I think he did a phenomenal job. And I hope he, I hope he doesn't take it too seriously. I hope he knows many of us fucking love his performance. Genuinely. Yeah. Couldn't agree more. Well, returning to Siege to Burr, we see folks recovering from this brutal attack. There's waves of refugees leaving for safety. We're told that a war council, in fact, has been called of all the Fremen tribes down in the south in order to figure out their response to these sudden and brutal and overwhelming attacks by Fade Rotha. And a bloody and injured Stilgar actually turns to Paul and says, you must go in my place. Only knaves may speak at a war council. And you must be the one to speak. Stilgar is simply handing over his leadership to Paul. But of course, in Fremen culture, you don't just hand, there's no smooth transition of power. Right. It involves a duel and the previous leader must be killed by the new leader. Paul refuses. In fact, he says... It would be like cutting off my own hand if I had to kill you. I'm not I'm not killing you. And when Stilgar pushes him on the point, Paul reiterates that he does not believe in this prophecy junk. To which we get a really powerful Javier Bardem line. Stilgar responds, I don't care what you believe. I believe. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Powerful stuff. And once again, showing us the dangers of fanaticism. 
His literal Messiah is in his face, saying, none of this is true. It's all made up. And yet, Stilgar doesn't care. Stilgar's fanatic belief runs too deep. I also saw an interview with Javier Bardem saying that when he read Dune when he was 25, Stilgar was one of his favorite characters. And Oh, it was so cool. When Denis called him and told him about, you know, I have a character for you, and he described a little bit of the character, at the end of the call, Denis said, and do you know the character's name? And Javier said, I do. It's Stilgar. And like, I can't believe you're offering me Stil- Stilgar. Oh my goodness. Which is just a great little story. But to think about, you know, Javier Bardem and you watch him talk and I forget, you know, you just like look up an interview of him talking like normally he yeah. is doing so many things to become this character, to become Stilgar. So many choices. His mannerisms are so specific the way he has these kind of like teary eyed, you know, slack jawed look as he's looking at Paul, it is transformative. It's really, really unreal. And even as someone with a little bit of acting experience myself, I'm like, I don't even know how you begin to do something like that, man. It's so fucking crazy. He's so good. Yeah, truly. One of my favorite parts of this film. Every, everyone did an amazing job, but how we are Bardem knocked it out of the park. And what a lovel- lovely story that Stilgar was one of his favorite characters. This movie, truly in so many ways, feels like a dream come true for so many people, including myself. It's wild stuff. Well, back to the movie. Everyone is still pushing Paul to go south, and he is still resisting. He knows that if he goes south, he will unleash the jihad. And he gets so fed up with people pushing him to go that he even at one moment snaps at gurney halleck he says to gurney go down south and take care of my mother that's an order gurney halleck Uh, yeah and and it's timmy really showing us that dark side we're about to witness for ourselves in the final third of this movie that's an order gurney halleck yeah josh brolin does such a great job in his performance so many times in this movie but there's a moment here where he just he says like, yes, Lord. And he he says it in just such a defeated way. He's so clearly hurt by this. And naturally this goes so far beyond just like, Oh, my commander used a harsh tone with me. Paul is family. He is young pup, Paul and Gurney as a character deeply marked by the trauma of losing his family. As he'll point out in the cave of birds, his whole family was killed and that he has this adoptive, you know, son or nephew or whatever. And his, and he's saying, I'm going to stay behind and you can't be here to help me or protect me. It means so much to Gurney Halleck. And we see that in just the micro expressions of Josh Brolin in that scene. It's just heartbreaking and it's so beautiful and it's so uh, subtle. It's great. So yeah, so true. Now, Paul is very much resisting, you know, everyone's giving him these, explanations i loved his mannerisms timothy chalamet's mannerisms as he explains to shishakli where he's like i can't go south and he says it in a chakopsa the fremen language it, it's so fun to see timothy chalamet speaking in fremen yeah but he is getting pressured by everybody so he leaves he like walks away he's like fuck this i need a i need some space chani worried goes after him but stops and tells them like yeah he's worried about the fanatics in the south and as he should be because it's really dangerous now timothy is not just going for a midday walk he's actually actively seeking out advice from Jameis. yeah from the first fremen that he saw in his visions that would show him how to do things and (laughs) unfortunately for him Jameis. In his visions, I think I have the direct quote written here. It says something like, a good hunter always climbs the highest dune before he hunts. You know, the hunter must see, you must see. And then, of course, the Benny Jesuit voices come back in and they're like, yeah, what he said, you should see. You should definitely. (laughs) Ditto. Ditto, plus one to that. Thumbs up. (laughs) Retweet. (laughs) And, And so, naturally, he is in this place where everything he turns to is saying, you've got to go south. Chani finds him and he is 
crying, just openly crying, which is hugely significant for Fremen. Mm, mm -hmm. And she says she will always love him as long as he doesn't change who he is. Oh, boy. Which definitely (laughs) uh, is unfortunate for her because that is one of the (laughs) things that he might have to change. But yeah, couldn't know that now, you know? Couldn't know that now. I also loved another line she says here. She says something along the lines of, others have made choices for us. And given the context of this whole story, that is so poignant. This idea that you and I have talked at length about in regards to Paul and his fate as the Kwisatz Haderach, his life path was effectively chosen for him by so many people that aren't him. He didn't choose his genetics. He didn't choose his training. He didn't choose his mother teaching him special Bene Gesserit techniques. Right, yeah. All of these things were other people's scheming and other people's plans of which Paul was made a part. And nobody asked him whether he wanted to or not. And it's an idea that also applies to the Fremen and Chani, right? They are part of a larger imperium that is desperate for the spice from their desert. They are this oppressed class of indigenous people. And decisions about who lives and dies and what happens to them are made by powers well beyond their control. So it just speaks to so many layers in this movie. The Missionaria Protectiva, you know, being implanted among the Fremen culture. So many layers of this movie that other powers, other people made choices for us. And we have to now live with the consequences of those choices. That is unfair. That is something worthy of tears. But it is the reality. And we must face it. So powerful and poignant to have Chani deliver that line and deliver that idea for us. I loved it. Yeah. I'll also say the nature of someone else making a choice for you and that determining things for you paints you in a passive role, right? Yeah. Someone else chooses, you just do. And that is, as we know, anybody who's read the book knows that stagnation and not making a choice is dangerous, is something that Frank actively advocates against. Yep. And although we know Chani will, of course, divide from Paul in this movie, you know, she's going to go off on her own, ride that worm into the, to the sunset, whatever. There's an element of like, she is in alignment with Paul, which is that she's comforting him. You need to make a choice. And the only choice he can make is to do the things that she's going to then hold against him. Yeah. But of course, he also tells Jessica later, she'll come back. All of this is to say, I think the core of these characters are aligned and are actually on the same page. And it's just the like temporary stuff that gets in the way, basically. Yeah, definitely. Anyway, Paul resolves to go south and hashtag do what I have to do. And of course, Johnny's like, except change who you are. And he's like, whatever I have to do. And she's like, yeah, 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 but don't change who you are. And he's like, I'll do what I have to. She's like, no, I still don't like the tone. I don't like the tone of how you're saying that. It sounds like <laughs> let's you're, try that uh, one again. Let's try that again. Say, what are you gonna do? I'm gonna do what I have to. Now, see, still <laughs> <laughs> something off there. Something off about your delivery. It's feeling a little, feeling a little. I don't know, Messiah-y. You know, it just right. feels a little. Mm. Yeah, <laughs> getting the getting the feeling you you might change who you are. Oh, right after I, I told you I'd love yeah. you as long as you never changed who you are. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'm just going to do what I have to do. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> yeah, clearly clearly some foreshadowing of what's to come and perhaps some foreshadowing that goes over Chani's head. <laughs> yeah, true. Now, a- after this intimate moment between Chani and Paul, we cut to a scene of Fade Rotha entering an empty siege to Burr, a devastated siege to Burr. As we see these Harkonnens with flamethrowers, they sure do love their flamethrowers, burning what appears to be like the homes of the birds or perhaps even Salago bats. We know that Salago bats are used for communication in the desert by the Fremen. So maybe a little callback here to the book. But we see them sort of burning these nests, which is heartbreaking stuff. They're just in, in here just like killing all forms of life, which is horrible. Shashakli is bloody, but also with this, like, devil-may-care grin on her face. I was like, damn, okay. Yeah, she looks cool. Really cool. cool. She looks cool in this scene. 
total badass. And even Fade acknowledges her badassery. He admits, right. wow, you killed nine of my men with a single blade. It took over nine trained Harkonnen soldiers to actually subdue you. Right. Very impressive. But unfortunately for Shashakli, Fade doesn't really want to interrogate her. He's not here for small talk. He's here for pleasure. Right. And he reaches over to a flamethrower and does what flamethrowers do best. Right. Burn. <laughs> oh, I thought uh, something else. But oh, yeah, yeah, I guess they do burn. <laughs> burn best, yeah. <laughs> It's true. Rest in peace, Shashakli. You were awesome. R.I.P. Yes. Sahila Yakub, Amazing work. Now, the next scene. Well, first we get the sequence of the worms traveling through the southern storms as the refugees from Siege to Burr travel to safety. Paul, alone on a worm, who let him? Who let who, him do that? Whose idea? Because, again, <laughs> would make things a lot simpler if he had to, like, tell someone to get off in order to go off on his own. I feel like that's the first clue. He's like, I'm going to ride on my own worm. You're like, why? <laughs> red flag, red flag. You're going to change who you are? No, no, no. I'm going to do what I have no, to, though. <laughs> <laughs> so Paul looks over to Chani before he veers off. And she notices him leaving, but obviously she's got everybody on her worm, so she's she doesn't pursue. And that leads to him arriving at the Water of Life Temple alone, the caretaker's like, you're not allowed here. Yeah. And you know who doesn't use the voice like a fucking asshole? Paul Atreides. Paul Atreides. He's just like, I mean, I figured as part of the prophecy, I'd be welcomed. And she's like, oh, you know what? You are welcomed. Uh, and also, do you want some water of life? <laughs> like, this is great. <laughs> he drinks the water of life. And we see these visions of kind of like old Reverend Mother faces. Very, very cool. This kind of like flickering, you know, view. Right. And voices saying... Now you can see the past. Now that you understand the past, you can see the future. And we see this woman climbing a dune and then walking down the other face of the dune to the water's edge, right? The, the dunes, sand dunes right up against the ocean, uh, which is a natural formation that happens in places. I don't know where, but mm. I've seen photos hmm. and it's very cool. Cool. Now, personally, I think the shots of Reverend Mother faces and this like vision and I think that this is what Jessica experienced during her spice agony. Ah, yeah. This is the internal portion. And the external portion is the like writhing, pain, suffering. You know, and in the book, this is similar, right? In the book, Jessica is all intellect. She's like, what is the type of poison that's killing me? Oh, it's this type of molecule. I need to disarm, blah, 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 and then swap the, okay, now I'm safe. And now I'm talking to the Reverend Mother and blah, blah, blah. Meanwhile, on the outside, she's going through the spice agony. So I think, because we see Tim, we see uh, Timothy drink the, you know, blue raspberry Gatorade and <laughs> just kind of like <laughs> consider it for a moment before this like cool vision flickering. Next shot, he's fully in a coma. <laughs> so yeah. I think he went into the thrashing, you know, eyes open, gasp, and then a sleep coma. And then he's found, right? Like that that's kind of my theory based on the storytelling that Denise seems to be doing here. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That makes sense. That that makes a lot of sense to me. Because we didn't see Jessica's internal struggle, right? We only saw the pure agony on the outside. Right. So this this perhaps is a hint as to what takes place internally, the internal battle. Yeah. Although, of course, for Paul it's a little different because he's seeing bits of the future. And mm. this includes the woman from the dune because uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. woman from the dune removes her cowl, reveals herself to be Queen's Gambit. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Alia Atreides, <laughs> a.k.a. Anya Taylor-Joy, who is spectacular in the Queen's Gambit. Right. She turns right to the camera, looks at the audience and says, checkmate. Checkmate. <laughs> then she <laughs> makes this incredible opening gambit. It's amazing. And Alia is from the future she's like hey hey bro uh you're about to learn some shit that's going to hurt you to your core but yeah. i'm here with you you're not alone i love you i'm here for you and then she shows the baby that is jessica cutest baby my god what a cute child i know i know looking up to be very disappointed to see his father 
<laughs> that yeah. baby grade A acting uh, to look up and to see Baron <laughs> Harkonnen. Like, Truly. oh, that's not <laughs> that's not who I want to be my father. Yeah. And uh, very, very cool. Um, I also think that this scene will be even more impactful after the third movie comes out. Because I think the you're not alone, I'm with you, I love you is something that comes out of nowhere if people have no idea who this is or don't understand right. these characters. But like yeah. Messiah, they are a team in many ways. And so that message of you are going to see some stuff, but I'm here for you. Right. Is so essentially their relationship, which is very cool. Yeah. We're already establishing a really beautiful relationship between siblings yeah. for the next movie. I was a big, big, big fan of that for sure. I also wanted to quickly comment that I really liked the imagery of the water on the edge of the sand yeah. in this vision. Just because, again, if you know, you know, in future books, there are certain ecological changes that will come to Arrakis. So this sort of hints at the future of the planet itself. Again, seeing visions of the future. The Western Sahara meets the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, so there's in Eastern Sahara meets the Red Sea. So, yeah. It's kind of cool. There's 10 <laughs> safariprofessionals.com <laughs> has 10 stunning places where the desert meets the ocean. Nice. But yeah, very, very cool. Nice. And of course, looking back now on the first movie and then seeing how much Zendaya is in this movie, I am so excited in the third movie to see Anya Taylor-Joy, Timothy Chalamet, uh, uh, Florence Pugh, Chani, like wait Chani not Chani Zendaya <laughs> uh, <laughs> these these actors are all so good and to give them more time to just be with each other and to have those interpersonal relationships so 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 exciting and uh, so this brief view of Anya Taylor-Joy very exciting yeah I mean this is something I got a lot of questions about too what's the point of the sister why Alia who Alia where Alia and it's tough because I had to just deflect all the questions for moviegoers. Right. If you haven't, if you haven't read the book, I, I don't want to spoil what's potentially to come. And you really can't talk about Alia without the context of the next book. So for moviegoers out there, just hang tight. It's set up for a spectacular series of events in the next movie where Alia will take center stage. So buckle up. You're in for a treat. Indeed you are. All right, so moving on, in the next sequence of shots, we see that Jessica arrives at the Water of Life Temple and confirms with an attendant that no one else knows about Muad'Dib's coma, because at this point, the Water of Life has put him into a days-long coma. In the book, I believe it's actually a weeks-long coma. Yeah, it's like two weeks, I think. Yeah. Uh, she takes the opportunity to really flex the voice again here, <laughs> so because she tells the attendant, go find her. Where's Rachel? <laughs> Where's Rachel? <laughs> yeah, presumably she's telling the attendant to uh, go get Chani, which again, just a please would have gone plenty of the way there. Yeah, your fucking Lisa and Al Gaib needs Chani. Can you go find her? Every Fremen with an earshot would be like, "Yes, ma'am. Let's go." Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, feels like another unnecessary use of the voice, where just the mysticism around the whole prophecy would have been more than enough to convince people into action. Regardless, Chani does arrive in the very next shot on Ornithopter. She rushes inside to find that Paul is seemingly dead. Yeah. And there are dozens of Fremen circled around him. They're all praying. They're all looking concerned. Things look dire. Yeah. Things don't look good. Yeah. And Chani is livid. She is livid in this scene, particularly her anger is directed at Jessica. Yeah. And this prophecy that this reverend mother is fucking peddling left and right. And Chani, in fact, refuses to take part in any of this bullshit. She says, Jessica, you do it. You got him into this. You nearly killed your own son. You fucking fix him. And it takes another use of the voice from Jessica to get Chani to shed the tear and combine it with the water of life in order to resurrect Paul. Lots to unpack here. My goodness. Yeah. I think we yeah. both have some feelings about this. Yep. But let's talk about it. Let's talk about Chani in this scene and s some of the major departures in her character from the book here. What did you think? 
So first I'll just say using the voice on Chani removes her agency. And I get how this plays with the theme of others have made choices for us, but it feels so literally evil. <laughs> yeah. And it feels so irredeemable. Um, I also, you know, I, I, I mean, I, I did see your notes and I agree. I don't buy that Chani would be like, if she loves Paul, she legitimately right. loves Paul. And if you love someone and you think that there's a chance to save them, you're going to do that first and then ask questions and throw accusations later. 100%. You're not going to, you know, keep Paul <laughs> in a coma as a hostage against this person you hate. Like, the more I thought about it, the more it kind of felt a little off. Yes. Feels a little bit out of character. I also, I think this is something that will make more sense when the third movie lands. And I think it'll be something that I feel less strongly about when the third movie is out, but it just feels rough. I don't like her being robbed of agency. The fact that in the book, Chani is the one who understands Paul well enough to say, I know he would have done something as reckless as drinking the water of life as a man. Yeah. And Jessica hadn't even thought of that because she was like, well, I can't imagine he would have. And Chani gets to say, he's your son. You should know him better than this. And it shows us how much Chani knows Paul and how much she loves him. Yeah. And so that feels diminished as well. It feels like completely they're They've been dating for two months <laughs> and they're maybe not even to the, <laughs> I love yous yet in versus that they are each other's like ha other halves, you know, and maybe that, maybe that explains it. And she's just not that sold. Maybe there is some other piece of this, but no, it felt weird for me. I don't, what about you? How did you feel? Yeah, I mean, I, I also have major beef with this scene and this change in particular, the use of voice on Chani to compel her to save someone she loves life feels like absolutely ridiculous to me. And, you know, I don't know. I, I'm not speaking for everyone out there who has a lover. But for me, yeah, if my lover was dying in front of me. So if I was dying in front of you, yeah. If you were <laughs> dying in front of me uh -huh. <laughs> and some... Some person was like, yo, man, this blood ritual sacrifice, totally going to save him. Yeah. And I was like, okay, I guess this person knows what they're talking about. I would just try the blood ritual sacrifice. Yeah, we have to edit this episode and it's going to take both of us. <laughs> I can't edit this alone. I need you alive <laughs> and able to click on a mouse. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that to me is just so off base. We have spent this whole goddamn movie building up a beautiful love story between Chani and Paul. And you're telling me that she wouldn't literally go to the ends of the earth to save his life, no matter what that entailed? Like, yeah. that's so off base to me. I, I It took me completely out of the moment. And I, I couldn't help but put myself in Chani's shoes. And I would have been like, yeah, man, what do I do? Which hand do I need to cut off? I'm ready. You know, like you yeah. do that for someone you love. You do that for your life partner. Insane to me that she is for some reason standing her ground and putting her stick in the mud against this prophecy when her lover is dying right there in front of her. Right. It feels very weird, feels way out of character, not only for the book Chani, as you've pointed out, but honestly for the movie Chani as well. Mm. Like regardless of how strongly she's against this prophecy as the movie establishes Chani to be. The movie also establishes that she loves Paul, Muadib, Usul, Atreides. And this is not a loving act that she does here. Yeah. It rubs me the wrong way. Wasn't a fan of it at all. And then there's another piece to this, right? And I want to say my part here first to lead up to the comment that you found, because I think yeah. this is really good. Yeah. As I understood it, literally three times watching the movie, Chani says early on, when she says, oh, my secret Fremen name is Sihaya, Desert Spring. Paul goes, I love it. She goes, I hate it. Why? It's part of some dumb prophecy. And it's like, okay. And then later, <laughs> Jessica says, save him <laughs> or whatever. Do it. <laughs> She's right. Emperor Palpatine. Do it. <laughs> Do it. And she cries the tear. And I, it is, I believe it's Jessica who says, the Desert Spring tear the tear of the desert spring or something like that. And, you know, she mixes the tear with a drop of the water of life. And that brings the Lisan Al-Gahi back to life. 
and thus it fulfills the prophecy and everyone you know loses their minds i saw the movie three times and in three viewings maybe i'm just dumb in three viewings i was like wait so literally there's a prophecy about someone named desert spring or like a drop of desert spring water mixed with the water of life will bring the lisa now guy back to life like what what is happening like i didn't understand yeah. that and it felt as if things were trying to be kind of sloppily tied together yes in a way that felt and i even texted you about this i was like this feels like a brian herbert plot 100 like, percent. it's the Chekhov's gun that's like way too obviously highlighted at the beginning some part of some dumb prophecy yeah oh my god the prophecy later you know it's it felt very heavy-handed and that's how i felt very genuinely until i read the comment that you copied into our script uh so i'll let you take it away here yeah yeah yeah, yeah. so I, I think we both felt like equally icky about this scene but we recently got a comment on Patreon from one of our supporters that genuinely changed my mind quite a bit about mm. this scene. Yeah. And I wanted to share a portion of Angie's comment. Angie wrote, quote, I don't think the tears actually bring Paul back. I think it's the water of life. But Jessica knows her siege name and is using her for the propaganda so that other people in the room can see the prophecy come to life. It sort of adds to this tragedy of Paul and Johnny that they are caught up in the Benny Gesserit spider web no matter how much they try to resist. End quote. Yeah. And I let that soak in for a bit and I was like, wow. What a brilliant interpretation of that scene. And personally for me, that makes it so much more palatable. Yeah. Yeah. If Jessica is playing 4D chess in this moment and knows that she has an audience around her, for her to play this up to be in line with the prophecy, that's a cool way to think about it. And I really appreciated Angie's comment here, and it just made me so grateful for this amazing community that we've built around Dune and around Ganjabar. Like, this is exactly the reason we love hearing from you, dear listener. Yeah. Comments like this that genuinely open our minds to a different way of interpreting something or thinking about something a hundred percent and i'm come i've come around on the jessica saying the prophecy i'm gonna say prophecy lines that is clearly manipulation and bullshit and yeah yeah seen through a cynical eye it's really it's actually delightful because i got caught up in jessica's bullshit and was like oh prophecy <laughs> you know yeah but i do want to point out that Chani knows of a prophecy involving Sihaya, her Fremen name. Yes. That exists before this moment. So I don't know what that prophecy is. It's either the same prophecy and this is like a cosmic coincidence or, you know, something else, right? Or she, it's a different prophecy and that she's just a Northern Fremen who's like, uh, fuck prophecies. I don't know. I just don't like it because every, every Fremen name has a bunch of prophecy bullshit. I don't know. I don't like it. It just reads, I don't know. I, th I think the second half of this still reads a little weird. Yeah. I mean, it, it it falls into that trap. And again, it just feels so Brian Herbert-esque to like bend over backwards and twist yourself into a knot. It falls into this trap where like the prophecy is now becoming too specific to be believable. Right. You're just like, oh, and then the very specific tears of someone named Sahaya will, re will resurrect the the Mahdi when he falls into a very specific coma after taking a very specific amount of water you're you're just like okay now we're now we're making it so specific that it's unbelievable that anyone would actually fall for this that yeah like it, you know Jesus Christ loved drinking wine at exactly 3 a.m. in the morning with his <laughs> left hand uh, yeah. wearing sandals and you're like okay we're getting weirdly specific about this like prophetic visual and the more specific something like that gets, the less believable it truly is. And that's why, like, the manipulation is so vague and broad, right? Like, right. in the books, it's in, it, the missionary protectiva intentionally plants these, like, very broad and sweeping generalities about the Mahdi yes. and the Lisan al -Gaid. Yeah, yeah, yeah. For, like, cold reads. And, like, it makes it easy because they can adapt them to the specifics of whatever. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> you adapt it to the specific of the current situation right. and it just works for you. That's the whole point of the manipulation. When it gets so weirdly specific like this with the Sihaya name and the exactly what the tears will do, it starts becoming unbelievable. And it 
starts to feel exactly as you said a little too convenient that the stars aligned in this way even even if there is jessica manipulation happening in the room it, it would be very funny if her fremen name was like siago bat <laughs> and jessica had to go as the prophecy said the the <laughs> urine of the siago bat brings <laughs> brings him back and everyone right, goes right. yeah yeah uh yeah uh-huh. Yeah. 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 Totally. Totally. <laughs> yeah. Definitely still have some issues with this scene, but appreciated Angie's interpretation nonetheless. It, it softened some of the edge for me about this. 100%. And I think that seeing Jessica in a cynical light is useful for sure. Absolutely. I'll also point out in Dune, it just to be clear, Sihaya is Paul's intimate name for Chani. He uses that name to address her as like again like a pet name or like an intimate name right right babe boothang boothang it's not her siege name yeah it just all feels a little too convenient yeah and it, it robs us of some of the intimacy between them anyway moving on we get this post coma scene so paul's awake chani slaps him and leaves and paul looks to jessica now i only noticed this on my third viewing but they're in a crowded room jessica meets Paul's eyes and then lowers her head, closes her eyes and the whole screen fades out. Yeah. Fade in to, they are alone in the room and there's like deeper shadows and things are a little muted in the colors and Timothy's sitting and in like a dark cloak. Oh my God. Yes. And I'm 90% sure this is like a little pocket dimension conversation that's happening between them. Yeah. That's how I interpreted it on both my viewings. What? Oh, man. Well, I, yeah, I didn't yeah, totally. see it the first time. Because she <laughs> just got like closes her eyes and it fades to black. Yeah. You know? Uh, and it's not the kind of like movie transition where you're like, oh, time has passed. It's yeah. like a oh, shit, definitely man. like in their head. I just missed Sort it. of thing. <laughs> I think it's also in line with, it's been a while since I've read this chapter in the book, but I think there is a moment post coma where Paul's like, let me show you mother. And he like goes True. into her head, you know, he grabs and her like hand. Over, overwhelms her with yeah. his abilities True. and freaks her out. So I think it is sort of a reference to that moment where they, they have this uh, mental connection. Oh, man, I thought I was onto something cool. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, literally the first time I watched this movie, I was like, Oh, cool. Damn it. But okay. Full disclosure. First time we watched this movie, we're at a press screening. I had to go to the bathroom so badly. Yes, you did go to the bathroom at this moment yeah, yeah. and missed like the critical transformation. Yeah, and I got back and I was like, surely I didn't miss anything important. I was like, you missed really important shit. I'm like, fuck. <laughs> <laughs> it's just awful timing. I was going to throw up from how badly I had to go. It was yeah, a terrible, yeah. terrible timing, yeah. but it's fine. Well, look, some of us don't have that water discipline. You know? <laughs> how dare you? How dare you? And four coffees while waiting for you to show up. And I was, it's fine, whatever. <laughs> anyway, so yeah, yeah. I held my pee, okay? Okay. I threw up <laughs> rather than waste time in the bathroom. It's true. It's true. I would, I see, I jerked into the needle. You stayed, you survived the human <laughs> test. I, uh, I, I jerked back. So, as we all noticed the first time we saw this movie, uh, <laughs> they're in this sort of pocket dimension space. It's very, very cool. And Paul explains, I love his physicality in this scene. It's so detached and careful. Like he's just like moving in such a precise way. I love it. And he explains his visions are clear. He can see the future and he can see many futures. And in fact, almost every future that he can see involves their enemies, whatever that means, prevailing. Yeah. There is one in which they prevail in which they, the people that they care about, move forward. Yes. A narrow path. And of course, my God, Dune. <laughs> uh, books three, four, f five, and six, you know? Absolutely. Oof. Yeah. Narrow path. And I w also wanted to call out, I had a lot of movie-going friends who were confused by this scene and perhaps a couple of lines of dialogue were needed here to like hammer this idea home. Mm. It is one path forward, yeah. right? Like Timmy's not choosing from like a nice platter of three or four delicious paths that he can take in order for the ideal outcome 
or at least for the people that he loves to live, there is one, and it's the one we see play out over the course of this third act of the film. I had a lot of friends confused about that. They are like, why did he suddenly turn evil out of nowhere? And they perhaps, this went over some folks' head, that he didn't turn evil. He's doing the thing he has to do, and the thing he has to do happens to be evil. Yes, 100%. I also wanted to add something else that I feel like a lot of people online are missing. Mm -hmm. There's a moment where Jessica apologizes to him about Chani's anger, right? She's like, sorry, Chani broke up with you or is mad at you because of me. And Paul barely reacts. He shrugs it off and he says, oh, well, she'll come around. I've seen it in my visions. And this is huge. Yeah. Because there are so many folks out there watching the end of this film with Chani riding off on the worm thinking it's over for Paul and Chani as a couple. Thinking that Chani has completely broken up with Paul Atreides at the end of this movie and thus the entire events of Dune Messiah, which hinge on their love for each other, must be blown up and completely changed. And I'm certain that that's not true. Paul says it right here. She will come around. I have seen it in my visions. And you can make the counter argument that his visions aren't 100% accurate. But my counter counter argument to that is they're not 100% accurate until he goes through the water of life coma. Right. And unlocks, fully unlocks his Kwisatz Haderach abilities, at which point his visions are pretty damn clear. Yeah. And they're clear enough for him to not only see but choose to act upon the one narrow path forward that we see play out in this movie. So understanding that context, we also have to assume that he can clearly see a path forward where, where Chani will come around and that where she will begin to understand why he's made the choices he's made. Right. Of course, there are still questions that I have myself about how that reconciliation and that rekindling of their love will take place, right? That is an absolutely crucial thing to happen in order for the events of messiah to play out in the next movie but with the way part two ends there is now a massive lingering question about how denny and the team will handle that how this reconciliation between these two lovers will take place right it's something that i think really has to be handled with the utmost care because it's so delicate and it could come off as retconning or it could come off as like too convenient or silly or uh unbelievable Mm -hmm. so in this case i think i'm going to choose to just believe in denny yeah 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 he has handed us dune fans two masterpiece films he has handed movie buffs cinematic history Mm -hmm. on a platter Mm -hmm. and so i trust that he loves this story and that he doesn't intend to blow up Messiah in any way that would go against the original text. So I trust that he will figure out a way for these two characters to come back together. A way that makes sense for the movie, a way that makes sense for the trilogy. Agreed. I mean, just let's look at like what he accomplished in this one movie. Granted, it's two hours and 45 minutes, but in the two hours and 45 minutes, Timothy and Zendaya go from having barely spoken to being a believable loving couple Enough so that we're like, doesn't she love him to the bottom of her soul? (laughs) I'm upset that she doesn't love him. You know, or I'm upset she doesn't act like she loves him to the bottom of her soul. He did a very, very good job of showing us this relationship built up from nothing. A reconciliation, a coming back together, an understanding. It could all be done. And we just have to trust that he'll do it. Yeah. But this ultimately leads to the discussion of the Harkonnen bloodline. Yes. So. The big reveal. The big reveal. The Darth Vader is father reveal. Right. So the fact that Jessica didn't know until her awakening and then she didn't tell him is kind of a betrayal in and of itself, uh, even as he's like fighting the Harkonnens this whole time. He decides and declares they will survive by being Harkonnen. And that is the way forward. And that's how they survive. Yep. And I point that out only because as we go into the final act of this movie, they throw back to that a few times, some more subtly than others. And definitely I wanted to like put this pin in people's minds. 
he is like, we are Harkonnen. Ba 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 ba. Sorry. <laughs> farmer's insurance is taking over my life. Uh, <laughs> You're not even a farmer. I'm not even a farmer. I have friends who are farmers. Pray for them. Um, but yes, we are Harkonnens. And then uh, we'll we'll come back to that in a bit. Yeah. Yeah. Keep that in mind. Indeed. Well, uh, the tonal shift of this movie fucking hits, folks. <laughs> yeah. Because this third act is wild. It's insane. Yeah. Timmy slash Paul Atreides. We really can't help but use that interchangeably, I've noticed. <laughs> yeah. I mean, they're just so... It's great yeah, casting. He's, he's embodied the character. Yeah. He, he is Paul Atreides. Yeah. Paul arrives at the Cave of Birds alone in a dark billowing cloak with this giant worm burrowing behind him in the Fuck, background. So cool. Fuck! Unreal. What a visual. Real. I'm so mad I missed this the first time. <laughs> An unreal visual. And with Hans Zimmer's score just hitting a peak, like chills, absolute chills. And this shot sets us up for what, in my opinion, is the best scene in this movie. The scene that rocked me to my core. He walks through this sea of Fremen outside of the Cave of Birds. And once again, Greg Frazier is fucking cooking with this cinematography. We get this incredible top-down shot, a sea of tans and browns and yeah. people just looking at the arrival of their Lisan al-Gaib as Paul literally parts the sea before him, the sea of people. I mean, the religious imagery is just some striking stuff. Yeah, it's it's really it's shocking. And I will point out there's a few shots of like him into the crowd. Right. And we see these like Fremen looking out at him. Yeah. And especially compared to the like very dark skin tones that we see in Siege Tabur and among the northern Fremen, I noticed a lot more light skinned Fremen, like a lot more like guys who might just be like Mediterranean or, you know, like lighter skin. Yeah. And at first I was like, oh, that's kind of interesting. Uh, must be because they are further south and there's ice caps on Arrakis. So this is maybe a place where there's not as much sun. And that's why you literally see a difference in like how much melanin is in people's skins. Yeah. But then also I was like, holy shit. So that's how little the southern and northern Fremen exchange, you know, people aren't always going up and down right? It's a real thing to go south and a real thing to go north. So much so that there isn't more like active mingling of melanin levels, right? Like mm. that there's a notable difference tells us that the southern tribes don't commingle with the northern tribes very often, right? Yeah. Interesting that you thought so deeply about that. This is very on brand for you. <laughs> I saw your note about the different shades of skin among the Fremen and I was like well I mean that's a lot of fucking extras to pack into this scene so <laughs> yeah, at this point you true. just gotta gotta grab any Joe Schmo off the street and be like put this robe on and act like you oh, worship this person walking through I don't think you, there were that you know? many people I think I think there was probably like 30 people in the true in the I'm shop. sure I'm sure it's a lot of a lot of visual effects here at play but yeah 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 um, <laughs> yeah, you know, it's, we'll, we'll have to see again, we'll do a frame by frame and we can right for sure. <laughs> we'll do a, we'll do a random sampling of melanin levels of <laughs> various <laughs> Fremen to chart out the, right. We'll take a screenshot. We'll bring it into Photoshop and we'll get exact like hex codes of, <laughs> of shades of brown. We'll, we'll do a real scientific analysis of this yeah. scene. Trust us. Every podcast is benefited by hexadecimals. That's what I've always said. <laughs> <laughs> all right let's talk about this incredible scene oh, inside the massive chamber the chani is being outright rebellious she's yelling hearsay at the top of her lungs here but no one is listening everyone's here everyone believes in this prophecy gurney even has to pull her down you know like sit down yeah for her own safety because she if she says the wrong thing here some fanatical fremen is about to come at her so really for her own safety it's like you now's not the time you've got to be quiet right and paul walks in he he boldly walks right into the circle of elders like he fucking owns the place which as it turns out he does because he's right. the duke baby <laughs> and 
Timothy Chalamet gives truly one of the most electric performances I have ever seen put to the screen, to the silver screen. I This is easily my favorite moment of the film. The first time we watched it, I had full body chills. Yeah. It was like a near religious experience. Like I felt like I was floating during this scene. It was very surreal. And honestly, I, much like Stilgar in this moment, was utterly captivated. I believed that I was watching Timothy Chalamet, my Messiah, on screen. Wow. Wow. And yeah, uh, something about the acting, the music, the moment of it all, the the turn of events that I knew was coming, incredible. It was overwhelming. The emotions were intense. I teared up on our second watch during this scene, just knowing how amazing it was about to be. Wild stuff. I will never forget how this scene made me feel. I was stunned. Yeah. Every time I watch this movie, this scene gets better. And I take note of, there's a lot of things. There's so many things, right? Like so many little details. And a lot of it comes down to performance and acting. Like Timothy Chalamet, (laughs) Paul Atreides, the way he uses his voice, the way he uses the space, the way he locks onto the camera first, fourth wall breaking. And then you get that shot of the Fremen, the one Fremen who's like, oh, fuck, he's looking at me, you know? And then the slow, like, walk forward and the like, do you think you could do it? Do you think you could challenge me? Oh, oh my God. What is so good and watching it a second time, watching it a third time, I'm like, this is one of the best scenes in a movie I've seen ever. <laughs> like one of my favorite scenes I've ever seen in a movie. And uh, I don't even really hesitate to say that. It's just yeah. so good. I agree. Yeah. Absolutely stunning stuff. And of course it crescendos in this like grand finale Paul Atreides, like thumping his chest, pointing to the sky and saying, I forget the line exactly, uh, something about like, as God is my witness, as the as the moon is my witness or something. The hand of God guides me. That's Remember right. That? Hand of God. The hand of God guides me. I am Duke of Arrakis and I will lead you to paradise. And just the power of that performance, what's being said, the way he switches between Fremen and... Gallic, like English, yeah. quote unquote, like the way he uses that interchangeably that just adds so much more mysticism. Like, I truly believe this scene would not be as powerful if it was delivered all in English. Mm, yeah. Like, so, that extra layer of mysticism comes from the fact that it, he's speaking in Fremen and it's still so powerful. Incredible stuff. And of course, we see him put on that signet ring yeah. that was passed down from his father that Yui saved for him. We see him put that on as he declares himself officially the Duke of Arrakis and the prophet of the Fremen people. This is it. He's leaning in. This is it. I'll also point out, man, Gurney looks so overwhelmed with emotion to see the signet ring and to see Paul putting it on. Yes. Something that occurred to me during my third watching was, you know, Paul has that ring in that pocket since he was on the dune where he has his first kiss with Johnny. Right, early in the movie. And right before she walks up, he takes it off, or maybe he says it before he takes it off, he says, Father, I found my way. Mm. Calling back to Leto from the first movie, quote, I found my own way to it. Maybe you'll find yours. Yeah. End quote, right? Right. Leto saying, I didn't really want this ring, uh, but I found my way to it, you know? Now, I, I'm kind of of two minds. Leto was saying, I, you will, you may find your way to the ring or you may find your, you, you may not find your way to the ring and that's okay. You're still my son, right? So Paul saying, father, I found my way is either the kind of like naive, unawakened Paul saying, oh, well, my way is with the Fremen and away from ducal responsibilities. I'm not the Duke of Arrakis. And then his full awakening, he's like, well, actually, <laughs> Yeah. This, you know, ring allows me to manipulate even better or is like the important legal distinction that allows me to not fight Stilgar, blah, 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 whatever. Um, The other possibility is that he is starting to see the shape of what he's going to have to do. And down the road, he knows his way will be returning to the ring once he is fully accepted within the Fremen. 
And that's why he takes it off and puts it away. Yeah. I found my way. I'm here with the Fremen. I need to be Fremen. And then eventually I'll get back to the ring, you know? Yeah. Either way, thought it was cool to see so early in the movie, relatively, taking off the ring, putting it in that pocket, and then it comes out of that pocket at that moment. It's just so, it's cool. It's cool to see that stuff. Yeah. It's a powerful symbol. It's also, in fact, the symbol that he uses in the very next shot. <laughs> yeah. To seal a little distrance message to the emperor of the known universe, yep. daring him to come to Arrakis and to fuck around and find out, baby. <laughs> He's like, I wrote you a chart. It's got fuck around on one axis and find out on the other. Come here. <laughs> <laughs> Say hi. <laughs> yeah. It's delightful, right? Like Shaddam gets this message. He reads it on that scroll and uh, just drops it, walks away. People laughed in the theater when they saw that. Yeah. But he's just stunned. He's like, fuck that. I don't want to read that. Who handed me that? I hate this. <laughs> hate this day. <laughs> and Irulan picks it up and reads it, only to then immediately pull it and talk to Moheim about it. She's like, Moheim, what the fuck? Paul is alive. Remember when yeah. I was like, hey, is he right? And she was like, don't fucking talk about it. He's alive. Wait, were you behind this? Mm-hmm. And Moheim's like, of course I was behind it. <laughs> Why else would he do it if I had advised him to do it, you know? Yeah. Literally, this entire movie, the plot, a lot of it comes down to Mohaim, who is saying how Atreides was becoming too rebellious and hard to control for the Bene Gesserit breeding program. Right. They had spent 90 generations working on House Atreides, and now they're getting a little bit dangerous, and so we need to eliminate them. Yes. And this feels like another notable change that I don't particularly care for Hmm. because the Bene Gesserit have contingencies like that is canonical and they do in this movie and they do in the book, but it's not like a house's rebelliousness would ever get in the way of the Bene Gesserit doing their, their duties and getting stuff done. Like if it's the case of like, Fade Rautha Harkonnen, who's a psychopath who kills people left and right just because he wants to, seduce him. Done. You have his genetic material. That's all you need. You can raise the kid on Wallach 9. You don't have to, you know, doesn't have to even be a part of House Harkonnen right now. Just wait for the psychopaths to die off and then maybe in two generations, bring him back, you know? Mm -hmm. Easy. Fine. The Bene Gesserit is not that vulnerable. Making the Bene Gesserit sound like an order that could be undone by a house getting a little bit out of line just weakens them i think Mm. i don't know this felt a little bit like nerfing the power of the Bene Gesserit. Mm. interesting yeah i i can see where you you would take issue with that uh i didn't necessarily have a problem with moheim being behind it because that is true to the books, to some extent, the Benny Dreseret are pulling many strings behind the scene. Maybe she's not so directly involved with the eradication of a whole house, but she's certainly involved with many of the events on Arrakis. I think, once again, though, this speaks to Denny wanting to shift the focus of this film to be a story about the Benny Dreseret mm-hmm. and the sisterhood yeah. pulling strings and controlling the politics of the Imperium and the fates of many people from the shadows and this perhaps serves as an example that like your fate could be decided on a whim like we don't know what too rebellious even means right like (laughs) what like was was house atreides too rowdy at a house party last weekend like (laughs) what exactly was the line where the benny jesuit sister had sat down and was like we need to actually eradicate this entire genetic line of people they are playing their music too loud (laughs) it's far too loud jesus mohan (laughs) Oh my god. Ba-dum, 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 that bass, I hear it all the way over here. <laughs> I'm trying to take a nap. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so the, I'm getting off track here, but basically I, I get where, completely understand where you're coming from. There's much more complexity and nuance to the Benny Gesserit plans and scheming in the book, and that makes them far more deadly in the book. And here, as with many of the plot lines that we've discussed in the movie so far, it's a bit more streamlined at the cost of that complexity and depth for the sake of getting the idea across in a movie, I think. Yeah, agreed. All right, well, we have a little bit more to go (laughs) in this movie. Yes, we do. 
we got to talk about the final battle of Arakeen and the ultimate showdown between Paul and the Emperor and Fade Rotha, of course. But before we do, let's take one more quick break. I need a breather. You need a breather. I'm getting low on water, despite me bragging about water discipline earlier. <laughs> uh-huh. So stick around, dear listener. We will wrap up this massive discussion and this movie in just a minute. Welcome back, everybody. My God, let's finish this movie. <laughs> <laughs> so we see the Emperor's disco ball globe ship entering the atmosphere of Arrakis and arriving at Arakeen. It hovers ominously over the giant metal tent being constructed for the Emperor and his retinue. Yes. Now the Harkonnens are completely caught off guard by this. <laughs> They Uncle, the what the fuck? <laughs> <laughs> and Baron's like, ah, oh, oh god, this is not great. I do want to say props to Baron Harkonnen though for calling the Lance Rat, because again, this is not something that happens in the book, but it is something that makes a lot of sense as a political move in the Dune universe. Yeah, the Emperor brought his Sardaukar to uh, Arrakis after he told us to take care of it. Right. That's something that the Lance Rite is not going to like. Let's tell them they're going to get here right away. And the scene with uh, the Harkonnens being grilled by the Emperor, very similar to the book, right? Shaddam is, uh, once they're kind of kneeling in front of him, he is yeah. asking them what they know. They don't know fucking anything. Truth Sayers confirming all of this. It is the uh, Asardakar who cuts Baron's medicine tube, leaving and, and disabling his suspensors leaving him unable to carry himself. This also might be the first time for any movie watchers that there's any sense of he's helpless without the little clicky clacky things on his back. Yeah. Because it's never really talked about from Denis hates conversation Villeneuve. Right. <laughs> Nevertheless, this is one of the scenes where I think we both agreed uh, Walken sounds even more like Walken than you expect mm -hmm. him to yeah it's a but... little rough <laughs> more more <laughs> <laughs> i need more say more it, he's christopher walken is apparently like actually a genuinely really intense and intimidating person and i did like his sort of physicality he's kind of perched like a buzzard or like a mm. vulture he's like a vulture yeah yeah and you see baron this magnificently powerful person on his knees like but I, I didn't know that you know and so helpless so I think it does a good job of showing how strong Shaddam is but it is hard because Christopher Walken has such a distinct voice and we are just kind of in that voice at moments and right. you know Baron what would you say about the Fremen it's like <laughs> oh could you do one more take? Just one more take. A little less walk-in. I don't know. It it was yeah. it was rough because regardless of I how agree. it should be it should be addressed and should be solved, it did take me out of the moment and uh, might have for you as well, dear listeners. It so. did. It absolutely did. I mentioned this in our spoiler cast episode as well, right after we saw the movie. I thought Christopher Walken was actually a weak point in the cast in such a strong cast, right? And again, being a weak point when the bar is already so high means you're already fucking incredible. But yeah, I thought he wasn't particularly great as the emperor. Maybe it was just the material that he had to work with. He didn't exactly get like a ton of screen time and a ton of dramatic scenes to play around with. But what he did have here in the film didn't really strike a chord with me in the book. He's much more intimidating. He is certainly much more menacing and a presence. And I thought Christopher Walken just kind of didn't carry himself. Like I expected the emperor of the mm. known universe to. Yeah. Felt like a, one of the minor missteps in the casting here, at least for me, didn't quite land. And certainly the, the walkenness of it all <laughs> was really taking me out of it. Well, Here's here's a possibility. So Christopher Walken is like a trained professional dancer and like his background is in professional dance. I imagine he could carry himself in a much more powerful way. So perhaps the sort of implicit message is this old power structure, which everyone is so afraid of, is in fact 
kind of a stubborn old man who is outsmarted by his daughter and his aides. Uh, he's sort of a false front. You know, he's like a, yeah, he's a hollow. A facade of power. Yeah, right? exactly. I like that. I like that. I mean, I think that helps a little bit. I don't know that that takes, invalidates the feeling of sitting in the theater going, is that walking on the chair? <laughs> you know, <laughs> is that Chris or walking? Uh, but walking like? I think this movie needs more cowbell. <laughs> but, you know, it, I could see that being a very compelling argument, right? Of saying, yeah, he is that way because at the end of the day, he, he isn't the one to draw a knife and use it and prove his power. He's the one to kind of stand there as fade steps forward and to just eventually kneel and kiss a ring because to, to a child, to a young boy, <laughs> because he can't do anything. He is powerless, you know, completely. I like that. I really like that interpretation of it. Well, regardless of how the emperor feels, shit's about to go down outside of this metal tent. Out on the perimeter of Arakeen, Paul is outlining the plan of attack. And he climbs up to the top of this rocky ledge. He riles up the fanatical fighters below with the iconic catchphrase that we've seen all over the promotional materials and trailers. Long live the fighters. Ugh. <sighs> So good. Really powerful moment. And again, speaks to how much he's leaning into the Messiah now. He's going to do everything it takes to get us there. That narrow path that he's seen in his visions. He's got to follow it. The attack on Arkeen then commences. And it is truly cinematic and spectacular and bold and big and awe-inspiring in all of the words. The nukes go off. They... Devastate and disorient the Sardaukar ranks, this horrific downpouring of huge chunks of what I assume is the shield wall getting blown to bits. Mm, yeah. In one of the most stunning shots of the film, <laughs> three worms emerge from the dust cloud of the explosion oh, it's so good. with screaming Fremen on their backs, one of whom I think is still yeah, yeah. leading the charge. Yeah. Just going all in on the Sardaukar who have already been devastated by the explosion. My God, just pure adrenaline in this moment. Chani is also attacking from another portion of the city with a separate group of fighters who do the classic Fremen emerging out of the sand, which I will never tire of. Give me three straight hours of just that happening over and over again. And they charge a different Sardaukar formation and we get this like more grounded, like stunning action, hand-to-hand -hand combat following Chani and the exact framing of this action sequence very intentionally mimics Paul's vision from the first movie where he sees himself in the golden armor mm, sort of yeah. twirling around and knifing people and then flipping to the camera as his visor goes up. Chani does essentially the same moves here, uh, which is a fun little callback and homage to the vision that Paul saw, but also to the first film. Denny sort of calling back to his own cinematography there. Yeah, it's so cool. Yeah. Well, Chani is distracted for a moment when a giant explosion rocks the uh, metal tent, right? The Sardaukar inside get into formation. And <laughs> delightfully, when finally the explosion lets dust and smoke into the tent itself and the Sardaukar march in formation into the dust... They just never come back. <laughs> it's just like, and they're gone. And then Paul just walks in. Like, no mention of the literal nine supposedly strongest warriors in the galaxy or whatever. <laughs> they're I just know. gone. <laughs> <laughs> Consumed by the mystery of the smoke. Yeah. Paul marches in so confidently, only really stopping to look at Fade Rautha a little bit. And he's not even stopping. He's just kind of looking at Fade Rautha. And Fade Rautha is just there having a good time. He's like, well, all of this is a huh, very interesting. You know, Paul marches straight up to Baron Harkonnen, where he knows he's going to be. Doesn't have to come into the room and look around and find him. He's like, I know where Baron Harkonnen is going to be. Goes up to him, stands over him, grandfather. Harkonnen's like, what the fuck is happening? <laughs> Stabs him in the neck. You die like an animal. Oof. And Baron dies. Yeah. Big bad killed. Now, this is, of course, a big departure from the book. In the book, Alia <laughs> Atreides, the three-year-old 
uh, who's been born and whatever gets him with the Atreidean Gamja bar uh, right. she has in her hand. Naturally, she's not born yet in this movie, so that can't happen. Right. Some fans were sort of saying that they would have wanted Jessica to kill him and then it to be sort of like Alia killed him through Jessica. Right, right. That feels like jumping through hoops. And yeah, not to mention like, like ugh. Reverend Mothers are not out here on the battlefield. No. Also, Jessica's pregnant. She's like pretty significantly pregnant. She's a Reverend Mother. But anybody who's been pregnant, I haven't been pregnant. Have y'all been pregnant? If you have been pregnant and I asked you, do you want to be in the middle of a battlefield? I expect the answer is probably no. Right, right. It's uncomfortable. It's just like you got to go to the bathroom all the time. He's like, no, I don't want to do that. That sucks. <laughs> So I think this right. is you fun. can't take a pee break in the middle of a knife fight to the death. No, you can't. You know, it's yeah. just not. Yeah, it's a bad. It's a bad take. I saw yeah. it a lot of places. Actually, I was like, wow, so many people have this horrible take that Jessica should have been the one to kill the Baron. And yeah, you could make some some convoluted reason up for Baron to die a little later in the throne room scene, right? And where Jessica actually is sitting. But like, there's so much more to take care of in the throne room scene. We don't need to make draw out this Baron death. And uh, yeah, it just feels like a bad take. I, I think it's perfectly fine that Paul and Atreides killed his grandfather, just like Alia and Atreides killed her grandfather. Yeah. Same end result. Same end result. And ultimately, it's fine. We will at some point talk about the fact that in the book, Paul says he sees a vision of confronting his grandfather and saying, hello, grandfather, and it being worse than the reality that he chooses, which is like the lesser of all evils. We are absolutely going to talk about that at some point, but for now it works. It's a great scene. It's fun to see this human animal concept brought up again. Yeah. You know, as always. Right. And then Paul turns <laughs> so intense in this scene. I love it. Walks over, stares down the emperor, you know, ignoring the Sardaukar guards. By the way, here's where I was really looking for Tim. Yes. Oh my gosh. I had my eyes Field. I was like, yeah. if Fenring is anywhere, he is standing right yeah. here. He's got to be shot. in the room. He's got to be in the room. Uh, but no, he, he doesn't. No. Oh, and actually, no, in the book, he wasn't in the room. In the book, he came from his private quarters for the final confrontation. Right, in the throne room. Yeah. But I, I had my eyes peeled in the throne room, yeah, too. Same. I did not see Tim Blake Nelson. We'll have to, we'll have to pause and stuff. Anyway, <laughs> uh, point is, he says, okay, hey, warriors of mine, Bring all of these people as prisoners to the residency, kill the Sardaukar, and then he leaves patting one of them on the shoulder, which is like a delightful little thing. Yeah. Fantastic. And then finally, he says, oh, and last thing, he says, Baron Harkonnen's body, toss him out, give him to the desert. And we, of course, get a shot of Baron Harkonnen's body being riddled with ants, very much the animal's death being reclaimed by nature. Right. That's right. There you go, buddy. You're Arrakis, you're Dune. Am I right? <laughs> my Arrakis. <laughs> my Dune. <laughs> so good. Well, from that scene, we rejoin the fighting on the ground, this time in the streets, in the fiery streets of Arakeen, where Gurney is just mowing people down. My God. Nuts. Yeah. Living up to the name. One of the best sword fighters in the galaxy, just mowing Harkonnen troops down left and right. And this scene ultimately culminates in a showdown against Beast Raban, where he finally gets his vengeance and he kills the man that gave him that scar on his face, mm, yeah. the man that sold him into slavery, and the man that killed his entire family. Yeah. A fitting moment for Gurney Halleck, something we never got in the books, loved that we got this moment in the film and that we got a bit of bit of closure here for gurney halleck's character arc the only tiny little quibble that honestly doesn't detract much from the moment for me but couldn't help but notice the tiniest of quibble here wasn't a huge fan of the dialogue between raban and gurney raban did this very cliche like look over my shoulder look who's back from the dead <laughs> yeah. you know and i was like okay that feels really out of place in this movie uh, you know kind of cliche i saw a comment about 
was at the WWE. Like, this is exactly what Dave Bautista fans want. Uh. <laughs> Which, you know, that's fair. I also, sure, another sure. quibble that I don't think at all depreciates from the movie, but again, a huge fan of the book here. If you couldn't tell by the four years of this podcast, uh, there is something about Paul getting the throne and no one being happy, right? Jessica's not happy. Johnny's not happy. Paul's not happy. No one's happy. And there was something poignant about that. And at the end of the first book, that's, that is the book. The book ends. No one's happy. <laughs> it's sad for everyone. Yeah. And yeah. Gurney Halleck's piece of that was he says, please, Paul, like we already know he's only on the planet for revenge against any Harkonnen. And the only Harkonnen left is Fade Rautha. And Paul goes, you don't get to make this choice. I get to make this choice. I'm fighting him. And he takes from Gurney the chance to get his revenge. Hmm. And that is another piece of the puzzle of no one's happy at the end of the book. Right. And I, I always liked that this not a hero story ends with everyone unhappy. And the fact that one could say Gurney Halleck's like, yeah, this is great. This is fucking sick. I got to kill the guy. <laughs> it's dope. <laughs> Super cool. Yeah. I mean, a little embarrassing. I said, this is for my Duke and my f- f- friends. <laughs> <laughs> and not my family <laughs> kind of a right where'd mystic. your family go bud <laughs> yeah, just, your friends are okay fair enough but this yeah. is also why yeah. you know his chosen family is, is deep absolutely yeah yeah and, and we do actually have a yeah. complete deep dive episode on gurney Halleck. so if you're interested in josh proland's character and learning much more about him than frankly you really asked for we got you fam Go check out that episode on the feed for a full deep dive into the life of Gurney Halleck. Everything before, during, and after the Dune books. Indeed we do. It's super good. He's from a planet of musicians. He is indeed. Explains the ballet and the still suit full of piss. <laughs> Hands caked in sand. Now, in the residency, everyone's reuniting, right? The battle's done. And there's a genuine sense of relief, right? Friends and allies are safe after the battle. Paul marches in. Mood changes a little bit. Everybody kind of turns to watch, including Chani from the crowd. And upon seeing the literal armada of like Lance Rad great ships in the atmosphere, Paul says, it's time. Let's end this fucking movie. <laughs> like, okay, it's yeah. time. Let's finish Dune part two. But also, we are seeing Paul, and I know this from the book, but I got the sense, watching it, we are seeing him see things he knew was going to happen. He's not like, what the fuck are they doing here? He's like, okay, that's happening. It's time. Gurney, get the prisoners, right? Oh, yeah. This is a play he's watched in his visions play out a dozen times, a hundred times. None of what's happening is surprising to him. Yes. He's just got to play his part. Exactly. And point in case, everyone leaves. He then turns and straight to Chani looks at her like no hesitation. No, where is she in the room? She's in the crowd and he just like, boom, snap. There she is and goes over to her. I'll love you as long as I breathe. Right. And it seems really genuinely hard for her to hear this, but naturally these are things he's done before. These are things he kind of has to do because this is the narrow path that he has to get through for everyone to be okay right right and it is these tiny differences in paul's movement around the room timothy's movement around the room that really sells me on this it's he is quisat's hatterack timmy right now right yes he is quisat's hatterack paul he knows where to look he knows what to do it's really really cool and then the captives arrive right he addresses them he addresses the issue of the lance rad uh, and effectively it's just like, what, well, whatever. Hey, Gurney, if they attack, nuke, the, <laughs> nuke the spice fields. And that basically settles that possibility. Right. No guild navigators here in this version. No. Which some folks were bummed about. Yeah. Or, or not navigators, uh, members, guild, guild members. Well, I guess people could be bummed about either, but in the book it was guild members, just like right. bureaucrats right. from the space representatives. Guild. Yeah. yeah. And that was cool because he was like, check your prescience. And they're like, okay, let's check. Oh, fuck. <laughs> like, we're yeah. fucked. Right. It validated that he was being deadly serious and none of this was a bluff. Yeah. And Fade Routh is like, he's bluffing. <laughs> and, <laughs> and no one knows he's not, but we get the sense he's not. You're right. Anyway. Yeah. Good call. Huh. 
Uh, although I will say this finale was so spectacular that in the moment on my first watch, I forgot about the navigators or the guild representatives. Mm. And it wasn't until I had time to process where I was like, oh, wait, that was also missing from that scene. I was just so wrapped up in the emotion of this climactic ending here. You know, if Tim Blake Nelson hadn't laughed and said, I don't know what I can say about it. Another possibility is he would have been a spacing guild representative. Ah, uh, yeah, possibility. Because I could see Fenring being cut from everything. But then like a spacing guild representative has arrived and then a quick conversation. Yeah. And that could have been a very cool short scene cameo that wouldn't have expected him anywhere else, blah, blah, blah. Just as a possibility. True. Interesting. Yeah. Interesting thought. Well, regardless of whether there are guild navigators or not, one thing stays true to the book. Paul declares that he will marry Irulan and take the throne. Yeah. Yeah. And the camera cuts to a devastated Chani. Absolutely heartbroken to hear this. Another departure from the book, of course, because in that book, a more stoic, a more Fremen Chani accepts she's hurt by it, but she still accepts the inevitability of this marriage and the necessity of it. It's a political marriage. It's necessary for Paul to overthrow the emperor yes. and take the throne. Yeah. Chani in the book understands this. Movie Chani, slight difference. It seems to catch her by surprise and... Rather than processing it in the moment, she does seem to be heartbroken here. Zendaya does some really great acting. Yeah. I I will say, I've thought a lot about this. I think there's two possibilities. One, they're going the heartbroken. She doesn't like the idea of Paul with Irulan, and that's the feeling. And honestly, I think that's the take that the editing supports. Yeah. Because there's so many, like, her face expressions, Irulan... Irulan's facial expressions, you know, like that's right. what the editing... Lots of cuts. Yeah, yeah, exactly. The other interpretation that only occurred to me, I think earlier today, as I was thinking about this episode, was that Paul marrying into the imperial throne is the is a more solidified betrayal of, quote unquote, who he is as someone who wants to be Fremen and just wants to fight alongside them. Mm. So it's like the ultimate I am this person from now on. And right. whereas she might have been holding out hope that he wins the fight, he gets stabbed, he comes back to her, okay, let's go back to the siege. This is him going, it doesn't end here. We're moving right. forward. I I'm committing to being a completely changed person going forward. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, I like that. So that is something that I think maybe that was in the script or maybe not. I don't know. Definitely the way the editing was set up, it felt like a tele, tele, telenovela. Telenovela. Yeah. It felt like yeah. the, Por que, Maria? No. Por que? Por que, Maria? Like, Maria. Maria. Por que? Um, <laughs> Mi hermana. Mi hermana. I only, that's the only Spanish I speak. Um, <laughs> <laughs> is, <laughs> is that. But the, um, Una cerveza. <laughs> but I don't know. I, so I think that there are ways that we could explain and understand this final scene that are less like she's lacking that, that sort of practical, pragmatic Fremen attitude. And, but if you think about it, about it, not as her as a Fremen, but her as a rebel, who's hoping that this is the rebel who's taken down the man. And now he's just going to come back to you. But no, now he is the man. Oh shit. That's not what I signed up for. Mm -hmm. I don't mm -hmm. know. Yeah, it leaves a lot of questions. And I think we'll be stuck with those questions unanswered until the next movie. Until we start wrapping up some loose threads about Chani and her characterization in this movie. Now, moving on from Chani, of course, we have the iconic showdown between Fade and Paul. Before that, we do get a little bit of chatter between the Emperor and and Paul, and I really, really loved this because just the few lines of dialogue here are just steeped in subtext. Shaddam says to Paul, your father believed in the rules of the heart. That made him a weak man. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And of course, we know Duke Leto Atreides was very much a Ned Stark character in this m movie, in this story, right? 
Yeah. Ned Stark, too good to live in this world of corruption and backstabbing and death. Totally. Yeah. Same with Duke Leto, too honorable to live in this corrupt Imperium in the galaxy. But I also love what this means for this scene. Shaddam says, your father believed in the rules of the heart. He followed his heart. Where is Paul's heart telling him to go? Chani with the mm, Fremen. Yeah. Oh, good call. Yeah. Where are his visions? Where are the hard choices, the more corrupt, evil choices, some might say, directing him to go to the throne, to Irulan, down the path that he sees, the narrow path? And so just the double meaning here that Duke Leto would have chosen Chani. Duke Leto, in fact, chose Jessica and <laughs> yeah. never married another person for political reasons. Right. Because he followed the rules of the, of the heart. Paul Atreides is not following his heart in this moment. He is doing the thing his father never would have. He is going down the path of the political marriage for the political victory. And so I, I loved the layers of subtext in just like the two, three lines of dialogue that Shaddam and Paul shared here. It fit so perfectly for the character of Paul and for the choices he makes in this scene. Yeah. Not to mention, what are the scenes that we get that show Shaddam disliking House Harkonnen and why? And the reason he dislikes House Harkonnen in the movie is because they don't fucking know anything. They're ignorant. But it's not that they're like weak. He doesn't dislike them because they're following the rules of the heart, you know? So... Paul is almost really uniting the best elements of, you know, he's wise and tactful like Duke Leto, but he's being ruthless and political like the Harkonnens. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's so cool. Man, good catch. Yeah, uh, and it, that really only hit me on the second watch because I knew what was about to take place and the heartbreak that Chani was about to experience. And I was like, oh man, Paul is not, going to be the quote-unquote weak man his father was in this Imperium. He's going to lean in to the darker Harkin inside of himself. Heavy stuff. Um, but let's talk about the final fight. My God. Mm -hmm. Paul and Fade face off in the climax of this story, and we get the iconic salute to the forehead, may thy knife chip and shatter. Shockingly, I didn't expect Fade to do this, but again, that twisted sense of honor, Fade repeats may thy knife chip and shatter <laughs> yeah motherfucker you know yeah. like the implied there's like an implied motherfucker after that <laughs> in the tone and in the way he like sort of smirks as he says it but again that that kind of twisted weird sense of honor he has where he, he's gonna salute the combatant in front of him i love this so goddamn much every time i see it it gets better because he's just like okay i guess that's what we're saying uh <laughs> well, okay my turn <laughs> May thy knife chip and shatter. Did I do it right? Yeah. I did. Yeah. Okay, cool. Let's fight. You know, it's like, it's so playful and I love it. He's just here having a good time and yeah. feeding humans to his humans. You know, he's just out here. <laughs> he's just out here. Uh, such a great character. Oh, so well done. Well, the fight itself is spectacular. We yeah. talked at length about this in our spoiler cast, but basically we both love it. It lived up to the hype. You mentioned in our spoiler cast chat that the movie sort of hinges on this knife fight being epic, right? Yeah. All of the events of both movies have led up to this moment. Totally, yeah. And if this had been a letdown, it would have been hard to stomach, right? It would have been a very disappointing climax to a movie, but it certainly lives up. My God, people are getting stabbed left and right. Paul Atreides does a fucking anime flip in the middle <laughs> of the fight. Yeah. <laughs> So cool. Yeah. So intense. And of course, we get so many shots cutting to Chani, genuinely concerned at what she's witnessing. Yeah. She still loves Paul. Yeah. You know, she still yeah. loves this man, regardless of the actions he's taken. And she doesn't want him to die in this moment. And I liked that we continued to reinforce that message here at the end. All of these cuts to Chani, Paul even looking over at Chani, which invokes fade saying is that your pet you know chani playing a part in this duel in some way i liked that addition right agreed but ultimately fade does lose the fight as we know and we once again get that twisted sense of honor at the end you fought well atreides before he collapses into a heap r.i.p fade ratha 
I hope his three lovers find a good home. <laughs> she's you implying they're at the kennel now? <laughs> they're very even temperament. You just have to feed them. Um, right. Well, we'll talk about food if you decide to sign the uh, papers. <laughs> right. right. <laughs> After the fight, Paul limps over to Shaddam and... Again, in a very powerful, dare I say, heartless moment, he forces the emperor to kiss his signet ring, to kneel in front of him and kiss the ring. And again, Denny, I hate dialogue, Villeneuve. Not a word is spoken. Just imposing Timothy Chalamet walks over, holds out the ring, dead fucking silent, and then stomps his foot. Yeah, he took the page out of communicating for horses. (laughs) <laughs> angry stomp gets the job right. done horses and emperors <laughs> yeah communicating with other horses other emperors whatever it is yeah stomp right really powerful stuff yeah and thus Paul Atreides overcomes the emperor at the same time we cut to this brief exchange between Jessica and Moheim definitely had problems with this because it doesn't appear that they're using any sort of hand signals or right. gestures of any kind. Yeah. This appears to be straight up telepathy, which in my opinion is lame. Benny Jesuit don't have telepathy and aren't able to communicate in this way. So this feels unnecessary and ham fisted, but it's Jessica basically saying, Hey, you chose the wrong side and Moheim reinforcing a very Benny Jesuit value. There are no sides. Right. It's just us, the Benny Jesuit, and everyone else who we are puppet mastering. Yeah. And I and I appreciate that they had that line in there. Again, moral grays, yeah. very important core theme of this movie that people might have missed. It's very easy to root for the pretty protagonist. Nevertheless, yeah, you're right. Uh, I think there's a lot of I don't know, psychic powers is, is just kind of a problem. And we didn't get any... It just would have been better if it were hand signals, you know? Yeah, totally agreed. And then this is also where Chani storms out. Uh, Again, when I, when people are saying I didn't see it as diminished or whatever, uh, this is all I mean. It's like Chani storming out is just not something that the book character would have done. But, uh, you know, again, the third movie is going to deliver on the setup that these final scenes give us. Yeah. Once that movie happens, I'm sure it's going to be great. And I'm sure I'm going to look back on this and I'm going to go, what a great way to get us invested in their relationship at the beginning of the next movie. Exactly. Exactly. We just have to, I suppose, have faith in perhaps a Messiah like Danny Villeneuve (laughs) that he will deliver on what he has set up here in this film. I mean, clearly there's a lot of Messiah set up here, right? But like, the stunning moment where everyone in the room kneels except for three people. Yeah. Paul Atreides, the emperor, Irlan Carino, the new empress at his side, and Johnny. Yeah. Like yeah. the clear indication that that there is tension between these three people and that there will be tension. Yeah. And, and for folks who know the story of Messiah, that, that is true. true. And pretty much any time Denny does anything, I tears come to my eyes and I hold my hands up shaking and I go as it was written and I fall to my knees and it's a very emotional <laughs> experience watching him do anything. Truly. He Truly. is the uh, voice from the outer world and the outer world is Montreal. Lisa Nogaid. Lisa Nogaid. Um, <laughs> yes. Well, Paul sees Chani leave and then is about to look back to, I don't know, his empress or the guy he just fucking owned. Uh, when Gurney gets a message, he looks at Gurney and Gurney goes, Hey, so all the great houses don't want to fucking kneel and Stilgar ever the wingman goes what should we do what are we going to do yeah and the exhausted now emperor of the universe says lead them to paradise Lisa and okay and everyone goes Wah! yeah yeah we're gonna kill so many people Woo! <laughs> Yeah, a that religious fervor, genuinely haunting moment. Incredible. You know, we talked about how bleak and how dark we needed the ending to be with Quinn. That's it. I mean, that feels it. that feels bleak. And that feels dark. So, really, a really a fantastic uh, way to end this movie, or to kind of give the final thing for Paul to say. Right? Yeah, yeah, and the delivery from Timothy. You know, eyes closed. You can see the pain. 
because he knows the words he has to say. Right. Of course, he's seen them in his visions. He's just got to play out the scene as he's seen it. Right. But God, does it hurt to say them. Yeah. Beautiful stuff. And if it's not explicitly laid out for the audience, we do get a quick <laughs> <laughs> shot of Jessica. And Alia asks, what's happening, mother? And she responds, well, your your brother just started a war against the great houses. He just unleashed the jihad and the holy war is about to begin. Yeah. So if that wasn't explicitly clear by lead them to paradise, it is now. I also got like viscerally sad seeing all these Fremen rushing on to like galactic warships. The idea of these people who are so adapted to the desert, they are so of the desert. We see in every scene of Fremen in this movie and the previous movie, we see how much the desert is a part of them and how much they're a part of the desert. And here they are getting onto spaceships (laughs) to like fly off to war on other planets. Yeah. And the mind boggling thing is this is an element of Dune, the book by Frank Herbert written in 1965. I didn't feel sad about that viscerally until Villeneuve showed me it. Right. It's just, it's just incredible what he's done here. Yeah. And again, sets the stage for so much of the themes and ideas about the Fremen that we know is coming in the next movie. Yeah. Incredible stuff. Yep. 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 yep, All right. Last shot of the movie. Yeah. We've made it. We're finally at the end. Uh, Heartbroken Chani stands atop a dune, maker hooks in hand, and plants a thumper to summon a worm to head off into the distance. And the final shot of this film is a close-up of Chani Kynes. And that's when we cut the credits. Kind of poetic that part one begins with Chani's voiceover and part two ends on Chani, a close-up of Chani. Kind of a full circle moment. Yeah. I think part one also ended on Chani. It was Chani and Chani. And then part two starts with Irulan. So... Yeah, we're getting the major players in all of the right places. Wow, what a film. What a fucking incredible movie. (laughs) I know. Like, at the end of the day, like, maybe that's all we're trying to say. Yeah. (laughs) Three hours later. (laughs) TLDR. uh, It's really good. It's like a really good movie. And I, again, I'll reiterate, I'm going to say it's really good again, uh, just because I know that I have been very explicit with things that i wish were different or like changed a little bit or things that rubbed me the wrong way or whatever yep i think that's just that's part of the process and i encourage you all if you just saw the movie once maybe on your third viewing revisit this episode and and think if like any of it rings more true i think the first time i saw it i was just blown away by how perfect it is and then even this third time i saw it i was like yeah my complaints are valid And separately, this is still one of the best movies I've ever seen and also would not even necessarily be better if I fixed the things that I want to fix. Right. It would just be more accurate to Dune. Right. Which is not the goal of everyone all the time. Yeah. And I I think that's a very enlightened thought. You know, the, the idea that you can hold both of those thoughts in your head at the same time. My critiques of this film are valid, but also they very likely would not have made for a better film. Right. Both of those things can be absolutely true, you know? Yeah. And I, I, like, I remember, I forget where I read this, but in in closing, like, I really want to share this thought that kind of changed my perspective on how I view a lot of art and how I'm consuming a lot of art lately, video games, TV shows, books, whatever. Mm -hmm. Someone had pointed out that, the problem with like modern critique culture and in particular like social media hot takes is that everyone views a piece of art and immediately jumps to thinking, how would I have done this though? Right. How would I have made this different? How would I have told this story better or different or et cetera, et cetera? You know, what would they insert themselves into the process immediately in their, in their processing of this piece of art rather than asking what should be the first question, which is, What is the creator intending to say with this choice? Why this creative choice? Why this here? Why this cut or why this music upswell? What am I supposed to be taking from this? Yeah. And I'll cut in just to say, 
speaking from a place of having a degree in art. That's right. Oh, it's working great for me. Uh, a learned man. A learned man. I wasted so much goddamn time and money. <laughs> but you may never know what they intended to, but you can understand the vocabulary of of the different art forms. And even if you don't know the vocabulary of those art forms, you can understand the message as it landed on you. And right. that idea of like, let me be receptive to how did I, how did I feel witnessing this art? And then, you know, exploring that, what is it about this artwork that made me feel that? Right. Right. If you felt something and engaged with it, like that's art and that's worthwhile. Yeah. It's the problem with a lot of the last of us too critiques right like right. people were attached in particular to one character oh totally and we're like well i wouldn't have done that like that's not a choice that i like yeah and so i am blind to everything else this story <laughs> yeah. is trying to tell me now you know yeah, yeah. and that's when you're being like obtuse you know that's where you're like it, you're make you're incorrectly engaging with the art in, in many ways and it's always valid to feel what you feel about the art but that shouldn't blind you to to other aspects of it so fully and so wholly yeah or like decoupling if something makes you like you know that game in particular but like if something makes you get grave of the fireflies that movie i had to cancel plans because it was so depressing but like that doesn't make the movie bad yeah because it made yeah, you yeah, sad yeah. because it's associated with a bad know? feeling it's right. a good work of art because it's so so compellingly communicates that feeling yeah 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 that's good art that is very effective and then maybe you don't like the contents of it but you don't have to engage with it fun fact <laughs> yeah uh, you, you can certainly not like a thing and it, it can certainly make you feel not good and you can walk away and be like well that wasn't for me or like that didn't work you know i, I didn't get the message of that fucking thing didn't speak to me at all Right. That's totally valid. Right. But to then be like, well, it's bad because I would have done this instead and it would have been way better. And, you know, that's where you start getting into territory where you're you're sort of being intentionally uh, obtuse about it. But regardless, we, we've found ourselves once again on our pedestals <laughs> oh, speaking it. about art, Fuck. which we both clearly love to do. Yeah. But it's because yeah. we love it so much. True. I think it, I think I speak for both of us when I say stories like this, stories like Dune, Dune Part 1, Dune Part 2, the books, they're meaningful. It's what gives our lives as humans meaning. And they're such a special part of my life. Uh, and I enjoy every minute and every second of uh, us on this podcast getting to talk about it and share that joy with each other. You know what, dude? Plus one. Plus one to that. <laughs> <laughs> what a heartfelt thing. Thumbs up. Thumbs up emoji. Right. All right, Leah, read the outro. Read the outro. Read the outro. <laughs> and I guess I'll just say quickly, you know, if you joined us for this deep dive, and maybe this is the first time you've listened to us, we have book club episodes that guide you through reading the books if it's your first time reading through them they are dense they can be a slog we made it as fun as possible and we kept it spoiler free we kept it engaging right. check them out we have spoiler free deep dive lore episodes where we talk about fucking uh cards we talked about what are we planets we talked about holtzman we talked about the timeline a lot of really good episodes abu posted an episode recently talking about the episodes that would be good starter places totally spoiler free just gives you more context about this cool universe yep. totally. and then of course once you're in too deep and you need a hand to hold as you're wading through the spice we've got those deep dive episodes as well so please if you enjoyed what we uh do here check out our other shows you might uh you might like our other episodes and before we let you go we have some ways that you can support us as well, if you're so inclined. That's right, we do. So the two best ways to support us and to ensure that we can continue to put out content like these epic deep dives that are so much work is to become a patron and check out our merch store. Patreon.com slash Comjabar is the place where you can sign up to support us on a monthly basis. You get ad-free episodes. You'll get invited to our Discord and our wonderful community of Dune and science fiction fans 
that is the best way to support us and make sure this show continues to thrive for years to come. Of course, we'd also love for you to treat yourself and show your support by getting yourself something from our merch store. We got custom designed Dune swag up there for the nerd in your life. And maybe that nerd is yourself. So check those links out. They're all in the show notes below. Indeed they are. We also love to hear from you. So if we missed a detail, if we missed a fun little thing, oh, I just remembered, each Benny Gesserit had a little plaque on their forehead with a different insignia. I'm going to have to stop each thing and see those, maybe they're each siege, you know? Anyway, cool. if yeah. you notice details like that, gomjabarpodcast at gmail.com. Email us, send us your thoughts, your questions, pictures of your cute pets, whatever you got. Send them to us. We always love to hear from you. That's right. We've been getting a lot of emails lately, so excuse the delay in getting back to you. We're swamped. <laughs> Indeed, we are. We're busy doing this. This recording session's at three hours and 30 minutes. <laughs> Love it. Well, friends, there is no real ending. It's just the place where you stop the recording, but this podcast is always one step beyond logic, so help spread the word of Mwadib and leave us a review on Apple Podcasts and Spotify. And be sure to check out the other great shows on the Lord Party Podcast Network on lordparty.com. You can also follow us on Twitter and Instagram at lore underscore party. We're also on TikTok at Gamjabar Podcast. Thank you so much for listening. And remember, whoever controls the podcast controls the universe. We'll see you on the Golden Path.